Hi, good afternoon. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order at 7.04 p.m. Certainly want to welcome all of you that are here with us this evening. If we could just take a moment for silent meditation, please. Thank you. Yes, Councilman Clement, you want to lead us in the pledge? <laughs> Does all right. Would everyone join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to our great country? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Councilmember Brown. Here. Councilmember Katati. Here. Councilmember Clement. Present. Councilmember Moffitt. Present. And Councilmember Shule. Here. Thank you. Uh, we have two ceremonial items uh, this evening. Uh, one, I had the honor and pleasure this morning of attending a reception for the new chancellor of North Carolina Central University, Dr. Deborah Saunders White. And uh, she was invited this evening to be here and I'm pleased to see that she's here and I would ask if she would uh, care to come to the podium for any comments that she might make. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, good evening. good evening. It is truly my pleasure to stand before you this evening. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, I am one of your newest residents, and it is with great pride that I return to North Carolina and to this great city. So thank you for allowing me to be here this evening, but I must share with you I did not come alone. I would like to take a moment of privilege, if I could, to ask all the members of the Eagle community to please stand, faculty, staff, students, and alumni. It is with great pride this morning that I accepted the key to this great city from um, Mayor Bell. And I want to share with you, as the 11th Chancellor of North Carolina Central University, I plan to make it a priority to strengthen the relationship between our premier institution and the vibrant Durham community. A relationship that we have been fostering since Dr. James E. Shepard founded our institution in 1910. In fact, it is this strong bond between NCCU and the greater dorm community that helped us become the, this nation's first state-supported institution supporting liberal arts education for blacks in 1925. Let me just share with you, in the context of where we are in the 21st century, no institution can stand alone. We need the community, the Durham community. We need the state of North Carolina. We need the federal government to understand that public higher education is a national good. And so I stand before you this evening saying to you that I am proud to be the 11th Chancellor. I look forward to working shoulder to shoulder with you as we continue to move this great institution forward. Thank you for the opportunity to come this evening to greet you. I look forward to getting to know all of you and becoming a good, solid citizen of the great city of Durham. Thank you so much. Well, Dr. Sanders White, again, we greatly appreciate the fact that you've taken time to, to be with us this evening and we look forward to many more great occasions when we'll be in your presence and you'll be in our presence and look forward to helping any way we can to strengthen the partnership that you spoke about between the city of Durham and North Carolina Central University. Now, I know you've got a lot of work to do, uh, so you don't feel bad if you have to leave while we go through our, our meeting. Uh, we have one other... Um, Well, this month we have a, another exciting event that's taking place in, in the city of Durham and I'd like to ask uh, Phyllis Cooley and Gary Jones if they are present, if they would join me at the podium. <coughs> Uh, this month we celebrate the North Carolina African American Independence Day, uh, as many of you know as Juneteenth. And this proclamation speaks to the fact that it commemorates the day freedom was proclaimed to all slaves in the South by Union General Gordon Granger on June 19, 1865 in Galveston, Texas, 
more than two and a half years after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation by President Abraham Lincoln. It speaks to the fact that former slaves in Texas begin to serve, begin to observe June 19th as the anniversary of their emancipation and coined the term June 10th. And it speaks to the fact that June 10th is the oldest nationally celebrated commemoration of the ending of slavery in the United States. And it's also known as Juneteenth National Freedom Day, Emancipation Day, African American Independence Day. And whereas Juneteenth commemorates the survival due to God-given strength and determination of African Americans through extreme adversity, hardship, and triumph, and today emphasizes African American education, cultural, art, history, and achievement, whereas the 19th of June, along with the 4th of July, completes the cycle of freedom for Independence Day observance in America, whereas 41 states, including North Carolina, recognize the 19th day of June as June 10th National Freedom Day to commemorate the end of slavery in the United States and to demonstrate racial reconciliation and healing from the legacy of slavery. Whereas to celebrate this important commemoration in the city of Durham, Triangle Cultural Awareness Foundation and its founder, Phyllis Cooley, in conjunction with Spectacular Magazine, another Cooley event, YRAG Entertainment, and its founder, Gary N. Jones, is sponsoring North Carolina's premier celebration with the ninth annual North Carolina Juneteenth celebration on June 13th to June 15th, 2013, the celebration begins on June the 13th with the spectacular magazine Man of the Year Awards banquet that will honor Durham City Councilman Howard Clement and 24 other African American men for their achievements and contributions continues on June the 15th with the Bridges Builders Youth Luncheon designed to build a bridge between positive African American men and our youth and the Unity March for the eradication of modern day forms of bondage, gangs, drugs, and et cetera the celebration culminates with a festival in CCB Plaza in downtown Durham, free and open to the public. Now, therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim June 15, 2013, as North Carolina African American Independence Day in Durham, and hereby urge all citizens to take special note of this observance, and all residents and visitors are invited to participate in these events. Again, with my hand in the Corporate Civil City of Durham, North Carolina, this is the third day of June. 2013. I'd like to present this to Phyllis and Gary for any comments you all may have. Thank you. Thank you. I want to make sure that you all mark your calendars first. For the, we start our event off on Juneteenth, off on the 13th, where we're uh, get, Howard Clement will receive the Lifetime Achievement Award. Let's just give him a round of applause right now. And, and then we will go with our youth, our youth luncheon on Saturday. The youth luncheon is also free. And we're, look, we're asking all African American men, we're asking youth between the ages of 10 and 17 to please come out. And you can just go to our website, spectacularmag.com, and register. And then we have our Unity March for the eradication of modern day forms of bondage, as the mayor said. And we go down to the CCB Plaza, where we have our big festival. Standing with me today are members of the Juneteenth Planning Committee, and I'd like to recognize them. First is the co-chair, Gary Jones, Ms. Leela Royster, Reverend Rachel Green, we have um, Betty Reynolds, and Keith McKinney. And there's one more member of our committee who could not be here today, and of course our photographer, Mel Brown. So we look to see you all at CCB Plaza, June 15th, 1 o'clock, from 1 to 10 p.m., anytime, come out. We got great entertainment, food, all of that, as we celebrate not just the ending of slavery, but we're celebrating freedom. That's Councilman Clement. First of all, I want to thank all of you who are here today. Thank the Chancellor for taking time out of her busy schedule to visit with us. And finally, to just take note of the fact that while we are speaking, there's a tremendous event 
going along in our capital city that I, I just couldn't ignore. And I would hope that this council at its meeting on Thursday will adopt a resolution in support of what is happening in Raleigh with respect to the Reverend Dr. William Barber and his wonderful group of colleagues and supporters. The Durham Civic Council, I know during my 30 years as a member of this great body, we've taken on issues that uh, some may question as to, its, as to their relevancy to our program. But I don't see how what's going on in Raleigh with respect to the Reverend Dr. Barber and his colleagues should be a departure from what this city council, I know during my 30 years, has stood for. Fair representation and fairness. We need, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to add to the agenda for Thursday, a discussion of how we, the Durham City Council, can support what's going on in Raleigh. And I'm talking about Moral Mondays. If you all know what I'm talking about, you should be no hesitance in supporting that effort. And if you'd include that on the agenda, for Monday, uh, for Thursday, I'd appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, welcome. Let me recognize uh, Councilman Shul, who said he had 10 seconds of Diane's time. In <laughs> Mr. Mayor, uh, my, my item is not as important or serious as uh, Council Member Clements, but let me just say that on the way in today, I did back my car into a public works vehicle, and so I'm expecting a bill from the city in the morning. Yeah, it was my, my, my good car. <laughs> I thought we might have done you a favor if it was that good car. <laughs> okay. I could just donate the car, Mr. Mayor. Uh, let's recognize the city manager for any priority items. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Members of council, good evening. No priority items. Likewise, the city attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, no priority items. Uh, likewise, City Clerk. No items, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we'll proceed with the agenda. Uh, first item being the consent agenda items, and I'll just read each one, and if it's pulled, uh, we'll deal with it at the appropriate time. Uh, first consent agenda items, item one, approval of City Council minutes. Item two is the Durham Cultural Advisory Board appointments. Item three is the Housing and Appeals Board appointment. Item four is the Mayor's nominee for appointment, Durham Open Space and Trails Commission. Item five is the bid report for April 2013. Item six is a resolution concerning Duke Energy proposed electricity rate increases for North Carolina, and I'll pull that item. Item seven is the merger of Next Step Housing, Inc. and Community Alternatives for Supportive Abodes. Item eight is contract amendment with Community Partnerships, Inc. to provide Workforce Investment Act Youth Framework Services from July 1, 2013 to December 31, 2013, and I will pull that item. Item nine is a contract amendment with Achievement Academy of Durham to provide Workforce Investment Act Youth Program Element Services from July 1, 2013 to December 31, 2013 and I will pull that item. Item 10 is purchase contract between Musco Sports Lighting LLC and the City of Durham for stadium lights, lighting at the Durham Bulls Athletic Park. Item 11 is purchase contract between American Seating Company and the City of Durham for plastic sports chairs at the Durham Bulls Athletic Park. Item 12 is contract for transfer, transport, and disposal services. Item 13 is a contract for processing and marketing recyclable materials. Item 14 is parking fees change. Item 15 is selection of electronic bill present presentment and payment vendor. Items 18 through 25 are items that can be found on the general business agenda as public hearings. I entertain a motion for approval of consent agenda items with the exception of items 6, 8, and 9. 
Uh, it's been properly moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Recognize. All right, entertain a motion for approval of the consent agenda items with exceptions of items eight and nine. So moved. It's been properly moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Open the vote. Is it open? It's not open on mine. Does everyone else have that button open? Oh, it's open now, okay. It's open now. I close the it passes seven to zero. Thank you. We, we're moving probably a little bit ahead of the agenda. Uh, as probably some of you know, uh, tonight we're doing a little addition to the normal public budget public hearing process. Uh, but we think it's also new, but we also think it's uh, rather innovative. Uh, in addition to comments during the public hearing, we're conducting our first ever E-Town Hall to provide an opportunity for people who wouldn't normally come to City Hall a chance to interact with council members. And for residents that are at home, some of you have already submitted your questions via the emails or YouTube, or Facebook, and Twitter. And we're still accepting questions and the Facebook and Twitter addresses are at the bottom of your screen. It should be at the bottom of the screen. Uh, for people who are here in the audience, uh, you may also submit your questions on a blue card that's at the table to my left over near the clerk's office. And I see Amy is holding up some of those cards. And the staff would take those cards with uh, what are the questions you might have. And now since this is a public hearing, and for those of you who don't have a question, but have a comment about the budget, you still have an opportunity to comment at the end of the E-Town Hall uh, at approximately 8.30 this evening. Uh, all we ask you to do again is fill out the yellow card uh, as you've used, as done in the past, if you have a comment, again a comment for the public hearing. And again, at the end of the E-Town Hall, I will continue the public hearing as we normally do. I know there's an item that's uh, on the budget that people want to come to speak about the proposed bus fare increases. Uh, we aren't going to be taking any action on that item tonight. We simply are opening the public for comments. So I would invite you to make your comments if you like uh, during the public hearing part of the session for the budget public hearing. Uh, again, we're running a few minutes ahead of our time, but I, I think we need to go ahead and get started. So I'd like to introduce Anthony Wilson, who will be our moderator. And Anthony, probably most of you know, is the weekend anchor and reporter at WTVD 11. And Anthony will explain more about how this E-Town Hall will work. Anthony. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening and welcome to the City of Durham's first budget E-Town Hall event. I am the moderator for tonight's forum. And joining me are Mayor William V. Bell, Mayor Pro Tem Cora Cole McFadden, Ward 1 Councilmember Howard Clement, Ward 2 Councilmember Don Moffitt, Ward 3 Councilmember and Councilmembers at Large, Eugene Brown, Diane Katati, and Steve Shule. Now, the City Manager, Tom Bonfield, presented the proposed 2014 budget to the City Council at the May 20th. City Council meeting. After that, the doors were open for the first time for the first E-Town Hall. The city began accepting your questions and your comments online. Now, as we move forward through this process, the City Council will evaluate the proposed budget. The members are again seeking your feedback. Tonight, we are gathered to discuss that proposed 2014 budget and the issues the City Council faces in making final decisions about the budget. Now, Durham and the entire county, as you know, have been through several challenging budget years. The city has experienced a decline in revenues, while the demand for services has remained constant. In some instances, it has increased. Positions were eliminated. Departments streamlined and programs and services scrutinized for better efficiency and maximization of resources. Now, clearly, those resources are limited. So the City Council wants to hear from you now. 
to make sure resources are invested where you want them invested. And that brings us to our first question of the night. Mayor Bell, this question is for you. What is the city doing to create more jobs in Durham? And l let me say, first of all, that uh, the city tries to run as efficiently as possible, uh, which means we try to minimize the amount of persons we have to bring on to do a particular task. But having said that, I think this city council has been very proactive in trying to create the type of environment that would make, uh, encourage developers to want to expand or to come to Durham. And I, I think you've seen a lot of that happening, particularly in our downtown area, but uh, more importantly, uh, even on some of the areas outside of the downtown. Now, construction is probably one of the, uh, as they say, housing is one of the things that leads back the economy. And we're beginning to see an uptick in the request for new building permits. Uh, likewise, the city itself has taken on a very Herculean task by developing the Rolling Hill site, which is going to provide for construction and jobs. But I think we are more enabler, an enabler in trying to create the environment to want persons to invest in Durham, to continue to invest in Durham, and we try to facilitate that process as much as possible uh, when, when new development is coming on board. All that has a backdrop for creating jobs in our community. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I did not mention earlier, and not that any of you need this information, we're going to limit your responses to about two minutes. <laughs> so we can keep things moving here. We have several questions, and they're still coming in. Councilmember Katati, the Ellaby Creek Trail Extension Project can get over a million from federal funding if we can just put up $270,400. The $75,000, this person said, will make us lose the opportunity this year. Why shortchange the Ellerby Creek Trail? Well, thank you for that, um, moderator and anchorman Williams. It's a pleasure to see you tonight. Um, I would say that w I flagged this item at the budget hearing last week, and we will have additional discussion on Thursday. But it is still very much uh, in debate as to whether those federal funds are accessible before 2016 or 2015. So the fact that we have dedicated $75,000 in right-of-way acquisition for this year may in fact be as much as we could possibly do. I do serve on the uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization, uh, Transportation Advisory Committee, and the MPO would have to authorize the CMAC funds, I believe. And so again, we'll have additional uh, information on Thursday and keep discussing it. But if we do think we need additional funds to um, collect those federal monies this year, then I will certainly advocate for that. Again, I'm not sure that that's the case. And in fact, if we did, we could jeopardize those federal funds, which is something that has not been discussed in, with the public. Thank you. Any follow-up comment from any of the members? Mr. Buffett. Good evening, Anthony. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to add that uh, even if we allocate $75,000 now, if, in fact, we do get to a place where the design is done and the easement's in hand, we can always come back and adjust the, um, the um, CIP later. All right. Thank you very much. Mr. Shule, this question is for you. A citizen asks, how does the city plan to pay for all of the affordable housing work we still need to do in the Northeast Central Durham area when you are planning to use all resources on rolling hills. Thank you very much, it's a great question. Um, we're not planning to use all of our resources on rolling hills. Uh, we have substantial resources uh, invested there and that's a a, a very large commitment on behalf of the city, and I think a worthy one. Uh, but we also have now, uh, we passed last year, a penny for housing, which is one cent on, the, on your taxes uh, to pay for affordable housing in Durham, in, in all parts of Durham. And we do a lot of things with that money. Uh, we have $200,000 a year that we invest into rapid rehousing to get homeless people uh, in, into permanent housing quickly. Uh, we uh, have, uh, we support second mortgages for people uh, who have habitat homes uh, in southwest central Durham or northeast central Durham. Uh, we have, uh, we have rental, uh, we have uh, a repair support for 
uh, low-income elderly. Uh, we have lots of other things that we're doing with this. And then what we have also with the penny is we have a fund where people who have affordable housing projects that can, le that can uh, be leveraged, um, that can leverage state money and other private and private development money uh, to come to this fund and apply for that money. And we have a process for that. And over the, in the years 2000 and, uh, and 2000, fiscal year 2014 to 2018, we have about six and a half million dollars in that fund. So there is plenty of availability over time and we need the, 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 uh, the, the, the low income housing developers, whether it be the Durham Housing Authority or the nonprofit developers, to come forward with great projects uh, that are both well financed and make sense financially uh, and uh, will, will, will advance our, our affordable housing goals. Thank you, sir. Follow up comment, Mr. Brown. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Uh, that was a very good question. And, uh, you know, a few of us were uh, somewhat critical of the Rolling, Rolling Hills project, though at the end I, uh, I supported it. Um, I felt that in many ways it was a better deal for the developer than for the citizens of Durham uh, because the costs are coming in are about $180,000 per unit, uh, which is really high. Uh, we also just learned that we're not going to be able to integrate uh, the lower income housing with the, uh, the regular housing in the apartment buildings uh, because the, uh, due to a variety of issues and challenges, not the least of which was from DINA, the state agency, that we're behind on the schedule. And so in order to gain the tax credit, the project has to be completed by the end of the year. And by that I mean the tax uh, component project. Mm -hmm. And so in, in summary, I think uh, eternal vigilance is still needed. Uh, I look forward to the completion. It's a great site. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're, we're in it now, but we need to make sure that the building is, the buildings are done correctly and that the citizen, citizens of Durham are served, uh, including the taxpayers and those citizens who end up living there. Thank you. Any other follow-up comment? All right, moving on. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden, this question from a citizen, what is the city doing to provide employment opportunities for our youth? Uh, as you know, some years ago, we started the Mayor Summer Youth uh, Program. Uh, that program is now in the auspices of the Office of Workforce and Economic Development. What we're hoping, though, is that people will understand that the city cannot do everything. We need our business owners, vendors, etc., to cooperate with employing our youth. And I hope that uh, some of them are listening right now so that they will know that they, too, have a responsibility to assist with uh, summer employment opportunities for our youth. Thank you. Follow up comment? If you're just joining us on television, you're watching the first ever E-Town Hall on the budget for the city of Durham. We continue now with another question for Council Member Katati from a citizen who asks, instead of spending so much money on the Southside project, couldn't the city just give the land to a private developer and let them make something nice of it? Thanks for that question. Um, I think that over time, many years of analysis, we've looked at that and didn't think that the private sector funding was coming in without investment in infrastructure. So this council chose to invest in infrastructure roads um, and matching funds. I think that we feel strongly that we are developing the area and creating a tipping point where we hope it will prove attractive in the future for private investment. I'll stop there. Follow up comment, Council? Uh, Councilmember Brown, a citizen would like to ask you this question. Are there other ways of paying for solid waste that put less cost on individual taxpayers? Excuse me, I assume that question 
is uh, related to the budget uh, discussions that we're going to have on Thursday at our work session. Uh, and what has been proposed by the city manager is that in order to pay for the infrastructure of our solid waste department, uh, including garbage trucks, which are number one, very expensive, and number two, uh, give out pretty easily over average lifetime, I think it's five to six years, that uh, we add a dollar and 50 cents per month to the uh, water and sewer bill. And of course that equals $18 a year. Uh, and this would be a fee, a fee for those who actually receive the services. Now, a lot of people do not realize this, but uh, if you live in a, a large apartment complex, the developer pays for garbage collection. And it is not done by the city. And the same for large businesses. So the question to us that we will discuss is do we increase overall taxes by one half of a penny uh, or do we impose the fee? And so I look forward to a good and vigorous uh, debate on that come Thursday at our work session. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, one citizen, I need to mention this, was so concerned about this issue that the next issue, not the one we just talked about, that a video was sent in along with this question. Can we roll the video? Take a look at this. This is what we put our wit on an everyday basis. Every single day, we have to live with this. So I'm wondering what can this situation repay it? Each time anybody, whether it's the mailman, whether it's the trash trucks, whether it's UPS, whether it's the meter readers, whatever, or just the wind blowing, we have to deal with it every single day. And the truck is long gone, but the dust stays behind for minutes. As you see, the truck is completely gone, but we still have the dust clouds that we live with on a daily basis. It would be wonderful if we could get this repaired. This is the corner of Leonard and Turner. He wants to make sure you know exactly where this unpaid road is. One of several that still remain in the city, as everybody here knows, but the question from that citizen, Mr. Bell, is for you. Why does it take so long after city council approves a dirt street petition to actually get the street paved? That was, that was a very good uh, question and video uh, explaining what the issues are. Uh, the, the process is first that persons have to apply, and assuming they get enough persons along the right of way to uh, sign up for it, uh, then if the city council approves the paving of that street, uh, that's the first step. And once that is done, a uh, capital improvement request, a CIP request, is submitted as part of the city's annual budget, and you'll see some of that later on as we go through the pro process, uh, requesting the funds be set aside to purchase right of way or to construct the paved roadway. Uh, it's a time consuming process. Uh, it's a process of design, it's a process of permitting, it's a process of acquiring the necessary right of way if, if necessary. And theoretically, it could take up to 12 months to get that done. And this obviously varies depending on what property owners are going to be impacted by the project of this type. And once these steps are completed, uh, then it has to go out for bid. And once the bids are received and the contract is awarded, the timing of the, of the beginning of the construction can take up to six months itself, depending on the time of the year 
And of course, one of us are probably the most difficult challenges we have in doing uh, paving. So it theoretically could take up to 18 months uh, after the council has ordered the dirt street to be paved before it's ready to begin construction. And that assumes that the money is there for that to happen. I'm not sure about this particular uh, street, but I'm sure the manager is saying it and he'll come back with a report to the council as to the status of that. Uh, if street paving, dirt street paving isn't available, or we don't have sufficient funds, uh, then that gets rolled over to the next year. Uh, and it gets a part of the list of dirt streets that have to be paved. But the bottom line is it's a function of money being available, uh, the petition process, permitting process, uh, design process, uh, and getting a street, dirt street, paved. But again, uh, Mr. Manager, I'm sure we'll look at that and give us a report on that at our next, next meeting. Any other council members have a comment? Well, I'll just do a follow-up myself. I'm sure their person would like to see that get fast-tracked now that they went through all the trouble to show that. So <laughs> we will keep an eye on this process and see what happens. Moving on. Another question for Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Why not make city bus services free like they are in Chapel Hill? That's a very good question. Tom, why can't we do that? <laughs> <laughs> what are we willing to give up to make that happen? That, that would be um, uh, wonderful for the city. I don't think we have the resources that Chapel Hill has to do that. Maybe one day we'll be able to do that uh, with perhaps an uh, increase in taxes or come up with some other uh, resolution for doing that. But at this juncture, we just cannot afford it. The resources are not there. I, I, I would like, like to add to that. Uh, yes, what please, Chapel please. Hill has that we don't have is the University of North Carolina that helps pay the city for the free bus service. So that, that's primarily the way that Chapel Hill is able to offer free buses, bus service. Uh, the University of Chapel Hill uh, would prefer to see people on buses rather than having to build more parking lots and provide that type of uh, infrastructure. So that's, that's the reason that Chapel Hill is able to do that and we in Durham are not able to do that at this particular time. Hey, Anthony, we yes. spend $9 million subsidizing currently. Councilman Clement, you had a comment. I'm sorry. I just saw you raise your hand. Go yeah. ahead. Uh, just to add to that, that's on the Chapel Hill comparison, that's really an apples and oranges because uh, as the mayor has just mentioned, uh, the bus service in Chapel Hill, which has been free now, I think for about six years, uh, but that it, it's not, there's no such thing folks as a free lunch or free bus ride. Mm -hmm. Someone pays and in this case in Chapel Hill, it is the university. And now we have tried to reach out and are doing a much better job than we have in the past in terms of trying to get Duke involved uh, with some subsidies uh, from them. In fact, they are, in terms of uh, our bus system, which is free, they, they are kicking in about $300,000 a year, which is very uh, helpful. That's the Bull City connector. The downtown route. Yeah, that's the downtown mm -hmm. loop and also to the university, and particularly the medical complex. Uh, and we can all say we'd like for Duke to step up a little higher to the plate, and hopefully they will in, in the future. But every day that uh, Mark Aronson walks, well, let me put it this way. When he walks into his office on January 2nd of every new year, he's already at least $9 million in the hole. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is a difficult, complex issue. Uh, again, we're not a business. Uh, but this does not mean we should not use good business practices. And it's, there's some difficult choices here. And we want to keep the, the ridership as high uh, as we can make it. Thank you. Mr. Clement, I'm sorry, you had your hand up earlier. If my memory serves me correctly, and thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator, uh, there's a certain segment of the population that can ride the bus without charge. That's the segment I belong to, the senior citizens. Now, if, if, if my memory serves me correctly, the senior citizens, upon pres presentation of appropriate evidence, 
you qualify, I'm 79 years old, so I certainly qualify. <laughs> I can ride the bus at my pleasure. Am I correct in making that? Yes, sir. So, uh, and I don't want us to forget that because I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm one of the few bus riders sitting around this platform tonight. And uh, I'm proud of the fact that once you reach my age, you can ride the bus free. Thank you. One follow-up question quickly. You say appropriate evidence is presented. What sort of proof, other than your own face, do you have to present in case a bus driver asks if you are indeed, not you personally, but the driver is a senior citizen? Well, that, that, is, that has not been an issue. <laughs> for you. <laughs> But, uh, but for those who are watching and listening but, right uh, now, they might be curious. But those individuals, and I don't want to get caught up in this ID thing that's going on over there in Raleigh and other jurisdictions, but the, the, the fact remains is people of good faith get on the bus knowing that they're 65 years old mm -hmm. are entitled to ride the bus free of charge. And I don't think that has ever presented an issue. Uh, since, since that ruling went into effect. Uh, so I, I want the public to be aware of that. that and, and, and that portion of the public that is entitled is a growing segment. Every day. <laughs> People are getting older <laughs> and living longer. Thank goodness. Amen. Mr. Moffat, you have your hand up. A Anthony, yes, I like that. Um, uh, Council Member Clement's exactly right. Anyone 65 or older rides free, but so does anyone 12 or younger. So we want to make sure that people understand that a large segment's already riding free. And the second thing is, is that um, if we made the buses completely free, that, um, the fares that we collect today actually contribute $3 million towards the bus system. And that is another funding hole, funding gap that we'd have to fill. And the last thing I want to say is that our fares in Durham, uh, compared to peer cities across the country, are some of the lowest um, anywhere. So we're, we're working hard. We understand that buses are used by people who, can, who have the least. We're working hard to hold the line um, uh, in a way that's uh, reasonable for the entire community. All right. Clarification appreciated. Anyone else on this topic? Okay. Mayor Bell, another question for you. Is a new fire station in South Durham really necessary? Well, again, we, we rely very heavily on our staff in terms of their requests and presentations that they make. Uh, I'm not a fireman, but uh, I, I, we, we've had recommendations as to where fire stations should be located, and it's in their considered judgment, uh, they feel it's appropriate that a new fire station would be required in that particular area. Anyone else? Council, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mr. Schultz. I'll add just a slight bit to that, which Mr. is Moffitt. that um, it's, it's, we not only do we rely on staff, but they, use, they don't use just subjective judgment. Um, it's based on measures, it's based on response times. Um, the locations for those stations are very carefully selected. So, um, and, and there is a point at which the development of any community is such that it does require a new station. The question becomes, you know, how long are we willing to stretch the, uh, the measures and at what point do we put the station in? Mr. Moffat, thank you. I was thinking ahead. My eyes were ahead of my brain here. I do have a question for you, Mr. Shul. And this is from a citizen who asks, are city public safety employees compensated adequately for pay and benefits? Good question and an important question. Um, what I would say, one good indication of this is that we have uh, 513 positions uh, for sworn police officers in our community, and we have zero vacancies in the department. Uh, so that says to me that um, we are uh, not only because of our pay and benefits, but also because what it's like to work in uh, the Durham Police Department, uh, that, we are, uh, that we're doing a good job. Uh, we have a special pay uh, scale for our uh, police officers that other city employees do not have. They have a, a pay scale that goes from 3 to 5 percent uh, pay increases each year. And uh, we, we do feel that this helps us to keep the uh, police officers that we have. And what does that translate to? 
that translates to a police force that is solving crimes at a quite a quite a bit higher rate than than the national average and even the state average, and it also uh, helps translate to a falling crime rate in Durham. Uh, falling also, it, the, the the crime rate nationally has fallen over the last 20 years, the violent crime rate, the murder rate, and other violent crimes. But in Durham, it's falling faster than the national average. And uh, so I think uh, having a, a, a well-equipped, uh, well-paid police force, well-managed, uh, makes a tremendous difference whether or not you're talking about crime on the American Tobacco Trail or crime in communities. And so paying our, paying our police adequately is critical. And I can hear a siren in the background. They're going to catch somebody now. <laughs> I hope they're not coming for Tom Miller, who's out here in the audience. Yes, Mr. Brown. Yes, if I could add to that, uh, and, and Steve was not on council, but about uh, seven or eight years ago, we were having serious retention problems within our police department. That is to say that uh, quite often we would train them, and Durham is noted for, for having one of the, the best police academies in the state. And then they would very quickly leave to cities in surrounding areas because the pay was simply not keeping up uh, with their performance. Uh, as a result, we had to make a hard decision, and that was to increase taxes. But uh, some things you just have to pay for, folks. And I've always said that uh, you can't have a great city unless you first and foremost have a safe city. And so now to see the turnaround is really a, a very refreshing uh, to all of us as elected officials. And uh, we want to thank the taxpayers for understanding that as well. Further follow-up comments? Council? Yes, Ms. Katari. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Just a few follow-up comments. I wanted to expand that it's not only police but also fire that have a separate pay band and that just last week we got new data in graphic form that I'm sure our staff would be happy to share that shows that our pay is well in range and in line with our peer cities. Um, and one of the quotes that came out of the, the uh, tragic happening at, in Boston with the marathon, but a quote that I actually pasted on, posted on my Facebook site that I think is really important is that Emergency personnel, whether police or fire, run toward explosions, not away from them. And we really value their um, work and uh, think this money is well spent. The other thing that I wanted to say that we'll get into probably further is just in terms of our general fund. Our police and fire, Councilman Schul mentioned 513 sworn officers. We have another 300 fire personnel. So just fire and police alone is about 48 percent of our budget so when we make changes it's significant and there's not a lot of room to do a lot of other things thank you thank you do you want to acknowledge there are questions coming in anthony can audience. i uh, mention oh, one more thing on, yes, go ahead. on fire uh, one of the recent one of the figures that we learned the other day in our in our uh, budget uh, deliberations is the fire department last year answered 19,000 emergency calls 19,000. Uh, so keep in mind the tremendous uh, need that we have here in our community for these, for these, uh, for these firefighters. Thank you, Mr. Shule. So as I was saying, the audience is giving us some questions as we move through the evening. We want to acknowledge some of these questions. This is one for you, Mr. Bell, came from the audience. The question is, what is the city's policy on granting tax incentives to businesses, and how can we make sure these are sound investments for all citizens of Durham? Again, that's, that's a good question, and I probably, when I was asked earlier about what does the city do in terms of trying to create jobs, uh, that is one uh, vehicle that we have, uh, providing incentives for certain companies depending on uh, certain standards that they meet, and one of the standards is the number of jobs that are going to be created, and also the level of pay that those jobs uh, will be creating. Um, so that, that, that is a, an incentive, and the question is how do we uh, make sure that they do what they commit to do. Uh, that's the responsibility of the staff to follow up on that. Uh, there's a, an agreement that's signed between the city and the company that receives incentives in terms of certain measurement marks that they are expected to meet. And uh, if they meet those marks, uh, they receive the incentives. If they don't, uh, they don't receive the incentives. Follow up? Yes, Mr. Brown. Well, I would suggest that uh, 
what we're talking about here is uh, public-private partnerships. And we're beginning to see more and more of those uh, throughout the country, particularly in the uh, urban downtown areas. And for those of you watching at home as well as here, I would mention uh, two project, projects to you, and you can answer in your own mind if you think these are viable and worthwhile. And that would be the new, I say new, it's now 18 years old, it's hard to believe, Anthony, but the new Bulls Park, uh, downtown Durham, and the American Tobacco Complex. And if you look at both what they provide uh, for us in terms of entertainment, for business, for jobs, uh, for recreation, uh, I think the, the answer is overwhelmingly. They were two good deals. Uh, and what quickly what happened there is that the county built the what is called the south garage and the city built the northern garage but that project would not have taken place without the incentives coming from both the county and the city and one reason that we have incentives too in closing is that the cost of parking is so much more expensive in your downtown areas averaging between twelve and fifteen thousand dollars per car but if you go out to even Squ south square mall where you have a flat surface and it's open parking your cost there is going to be between fifteen hundred and to twenty five hundred so that's one of the reasons for these incentives further follow-up comments mr moffat this question from a citizen for you why are some council members in favor of a tax increase while others favor increases in fees. The, both of those are the intent is to raise revenue. And when we have a, a gap in our budget, um, our choices are to either raise revenues or to reduce spending, reduce services. And when we start looking at increased revenues, then though either of those increase taxes or imposing a fee increase or a new fee or ways to do that. And um, the people who support uh, increasing the, the tax revenue from property tax believe that it's uh, least less regressive, that it spreads the pain, if you will, over the entire community. Those who favor uh, fees um, are point to it's a fee for service. So only those who are using the service pay the fee. So it's just a question of who pays and who gains. With the follow-up, Council. Mr. Brown, a question from the audience for you. Why do we continue to raise water and sewer rates? In some ways, that's a difficult question, and yet in other ways, it's easy. And that is why, for you as citizens, when you turn your, your tap on in your kitchen or bathroom, we want to make sure that the water you are receiving is good quality, and it's safe, and it's pure. And these things cost money, folks. Uh, we still have some pipes, believe it or not, in the city that are approaching 100 years old. Uh, some of them are actually terracotta pipes or clay pipes. Uh, one can argue that in the past, Durham has not necessarily done the infrastructure job uh, that we should have been doing all along, uh, incrementally. Uh, but now that has, we're catching up with that. Where there are also uh, federal demands as well as state demands in terms of pure water uh, and also storm runoffs. So all these are driving cost up. But we're trying to do as best as we can to make sure that the taxpayers not only get good water, but a good bang for their buck from our water department. Thank you. Mr. Bell, another question for you. When is the city planning to build the new police headquarters? And where will the facility be located? How much will it cost? Well, uh, we've got about three questions. So. <laughs> three questions, <laughs> yes. Three questions. Uh, you, you may or may not know that uh, we recently uh, began public hearings on two proposed sites for the new police headquarters. So one is on the Federal Street area, which used to be the Federal Street uh, projects, uh, development housing. And others on Main Street, uh, East Main Street, close to where Hendrix Auto used to be. And so, what, what we're what we're doing now is going out to the public, uh, trying to get feedback from the public in terms of their comments and responses to those two locations. 
Uh, once that has been done, and uh, we've got in the budget, I uh, think about $6 million for, for planning, and et cetera. Uh, uh, once the site has been chosen, uh, the manager will come back with a recommendation, recommendation to the city council. And depending on whether or not we adopt that, that recommendation, then we'll proceed with the planning stage. Uh, once the planning drawings have been uh, constructed, it depends on what pro approach we take whether it's a design bill or a construction management at risk, uh, we, we will then begin the process of constructing the uh, police station. In terms of the amount of dollars that we're talking about, I think the latest dollars I saw is about $46 million, uh, that's being planned for that uh, police headquarters. And there are a lot of uh, variables in that. Uh, obviously, we have the present site uh, that has to be sold. Uh, it's a question of whether or not we combine the facilities over on Hunt Street at the new site, uh, but all that will be a part of the recommendations come back to the council uh, from the management staff and we'll make a decision at that, that point in time. I think it is planned if things go well, we'll be in construction, begin construction in 2014, if that's correct. Follow up from me, if you will. Mm -hmm. So you just said that the present site would be sold. I guess that means it won't be demolished, at least not by the city. Well, we don't know. I mean, that's, I, when, I, I mentioned that because the next question is where are you going to get the money from? Right. And a, a part of that comes from existing projects, developments that we have, and that figures into the resource for building the uh, police headquarters. Uh, I, my thought would be that we try to sell it and let whoever buys it do what they think is appropriate. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's very interesting that right across the street now, uh, we have a new apartment complex that's going up uh, for primarily uh, dedicated for students. But I think it's going to change the environment, and I could very easily see somebody in that corner where the police, police present headquarters is for uh, maybe a similar project. That's in your neighborhood, Mr. Brown. That would probably affect you. you have any comment about that? I will comment for sure on that. Uh, the, uh, what was there was really unacceptable for too long to all of Durham citizens. We had close to 15 to 18,000 cars a day going past there. Uh, it was an embarrassment. Uh, for all of us and uh, the firm that bought it is from Memphis uh, Tennessee they uh, they're going to spend about 46 million dollars there for uh, 320 apartments and they know what they're doing and they deal primarily with universities that try to get graduate students first because it's easier to deal with them but they have uh, student complexes such as this from Syracuse University to Cal Berkeley, California. And here's the catcher. They built, some of you will remember this, Granville Towers in Chapel Hill. And that was the first private student apartment complex, uh, one of the first in the Southeast. And they still manage uh, that building. So they do a good job. And we're very, very pleased they're here. Will they pay taxes? Absolutely pay taxes. And the, uh, the value, of course, of that site and of that property will increase immensely. And I think based upon the activities we've seen, combined with their past histories, uh, that they will be good corporate citizens as well. Okay, thank you for clearing that up. One last audience question. This is for you, Mr. Shule. Thousands of kids participate in a youth soccer program. Shouldn't the city invest in more soccer facilities and improvements to existing fields? Yes. <laughs> um, I, uh, I've, I've, I've been a youth soccer coach for 18 years, uh, from the Y to Riverside High School. And yes, we need more soccer fields in Durham. No question about it. Um, we need uh, and, and that's not the only uh, recreation improvement and enhancement that we need. And the uh, Durham Parks and Rec Department is, is in the uh, final stages of putting together a master plan that will talk about all the things that we need, not, not, that, all, not that we'll be able to afford all of them, but all the things that we will need in terms of, uh, for example, there's an a outdoor swimming pool uh, on the list. There's um, many other uh, uh, different uh, kind of recreational facilities that people want in soccer fields are on the list. Um, we have 
thousands of kids and adults in Durham who are playing soccer, and we, we don't have the room for them. So we need that, but we need it as part of a plan. And I think one of the things I think we need to be thinking about in, uh, in the next year and is how are we going to be funding what we need in terms of maintaining our, our parks and fields and trails, and how are we going to fund adding to them? Because, uh, well, Diane pointed out, for example, how much of our budget is devoted to public safety. Uh, we have a tight budget in parks and rec and maintenance of parks and rec and trails and, and, uh, and open spaces competing with so many other needs. So one of the things I'm interested in, in us thinking about is how to set aside some sort of dedicated funding for these parks and rec and open space and trails needs. Because I think as a, uh, a central part of the quality of life in this community, why people are flocking here, uh, it's absolutely critical. And so it's, it's soccer fields, yes, and it's a particularly close to my heart. But uh, I think uh, many other uh, recreation and outdoor needs as well. Thank you, Mr. Shule. Opportunity now for all you members to make some concluding remarks. Two minutes or less would be good, but we have a little time, so if you want to go long, but not too long, that's okay. We'll begin with you, Mr. Clement. Do you have anything? This, this approach represents, in my opinion, uh, an outstanding innovation for the city of Durham bringing more people into the equation in terms of discussing uh, what we may do. Uh, I like that and I want to commend staff and public relations people and you, uh, my favorite uh, TV announcer. Please keep talking, thank you. You have as much time as you want now. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Councilman Clement. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Brown. I think we made uh, a good choice with you, Anthony, to uh, head off this uh, first and hopefully not our, our last uh, uh, town uh, gathering. Um, I'd much rather do it this way than have coffee with councils, but that's just me. Um, because this is really, uh, Durham is known uh, as a participatory democracy type town. Uh, and we have many, many active citizens. Some of them will be here this evening. Uh, and th I think that's terrific most of the time. Uh, <laughs> but no, that's, uh, we're very proud of that and, and we should be. And uh, this is you know, like a New England town hall meeting. Uh, it's the closest to it that we have, and particularly with those viewers watching at home. In terms of the budget, uh, I think it's, it's really very simple. Every year, we begin with the premise that we have more needs than revenues. That's it, folks. We have more needs than revenues. And so we have to deal with that. Everything then becomes an issue of priorities. And indeed, I, it's often said that uh, you know, forget about the political speeches and the white papers and all of that. Show me your budget and I'll tell you what your priorities are. Uh, so it's always a good, uh, hard, strenuous combination of debate, discussion, and uh, it's, it's really crucial and we appreciate all of your, in, your input, uh, your suggestions, uh, and please, if, if anyone can find a grove of money trees <laughs> growing somewhere in, in Durham City, let us know so we can gather up a few more dollars. And I would conclude by su suggesting also that it is just a delight to work with these elected officials, and especially to our, our city manager, Tom Bonfield, uh, who's been here going on five years now. Boy, that seems like a long time. <laughs> and our city attorney as well, and, and clerk. Um, I think we have, and I think Howard has said this too in the past, um, and he has more of a long range analysis, but I think objectively, uh, this is one of the best city councils in the city of North Carolina, and I am very, very proud to be a part of it. 
Thank you, Mr. Brown. Ms. Cole McFadden. First of all, thank you, Anthony, for being a part of this uh, process. And thanks to Bertha and um, everyone, Beverly and everyone on staff who helped to make this uh, night possible. Each year, uh, we collectively work as an elected body to craft a budget that meets the critical needs of this community. And uh, very special to me are the needs of our youth and they must be addressed as a part of our budget process. And normally we don't hear a lot about our youth. We, we cry out about a whole lot of other things, but not about what's happening to our children, what's happening to our youth. So I believe this budget will help us meet many of the needs of our community's youth. From funding two positions, which I should have shared earlier, uh, for the Durham System of Care to continued funding for the Durham Youth Work uh, internship uh, program. And I believe these items will improve opportunities for our at-risk youth. I also want to thank our residents who participated in tonight's uh, E-Town uh, Hall. The input and feedback uh, we received from our residents is vital in crafting a balanced budget that will move this community forward. It is because of the residents who care about Durham and take time and effort to get involved in local government that we are a place where great things uh, continue to happen. Thank you for coming and participating in this process. Thank I you. apologize for my voice. I have laryngitis. We heard you, though. <laughs> Mayor Bell. Well, I don't know if I can add much more than it's already been said by my colleagues, and I'm sure I'm the remaining colleagues will have similar things to say. But this is, this is always a, an interesting time of the year for me. Uh, I've been through 26 budgets on the county side and doing 11 budgets on the city side, so I have somewhat of appreciation of what it takes uh, to get a budget done. And I think the value that this council brings is that uh, each one of these uh, council members uh, takes this role very seriously. Uh, there are certain areas that each one probably has more focus on than others. But I think collectively, uh, when we have an opportunity to discuss uh, the merits of what's being proposed, uh, we all value everybody's uh, input and respect their input, and uh, we ultimately uh, make a decision. And as I said before, we know we don't please everyone, uh, but I think in the end, uh, we're hopefully doing what's right for the city and uh, what will continue to move the city forward in a very positive fashion. So again, I, I want to thank you, Anthony, for uh, your efforts here. I certainly want to thank all the residents that have participated and those that uh, participated uh, through through the uh, E-Town. And as we get into further discussions on the public, hear public hearing, I'm sure we get more valuable input that we take very seriously in trying to derive at a final decision on our budget. Thank you. Mr. Shule. Thank you, Anthony. And thanks so much for being here and leading us tonight. Um, and I want to Second, what folks have said about uh, having this E-Town Hall, I think it's great. And what I want to just mention a little something about is the budget process that we've, we've been through. So everybody will kind of understand it from, from the council perspective. Of course, our staff is working months on this, but the way we kind of intersect with the process is this. Some months ago, we get initial budget information to read through, quite a bit of it. And then we sit for two days with a, with a large group of staff uh, over at Durham Tech in a room for, big room for a couple of days. And then we, we get lots of presentations about the state of the economy, uh, both locally and statewide. And then we, we get lots of presentations from our different departments about the revenue potential and what it might look like. And then we get all kinds of information about what the spending priorities might be and what kind of choices we face. And then we lay out a set of budget guidelines after those two days. City manager goes back with the staff and the finance staff and they come up with then, uh, uh, they're, they're working on proposals. And meanwhile, we're going out and we're meeting with the public at the, at the coffees with council. We have five of them and we go to all the PACs and we get input there. And then we come back together and the, and the city manager and the staff has prepared a budget book. Here it is. It's large, it's thick, and what I want to say about it is this. It's fabulous. It's fabulous. The process is amazing. The amount of input that we get and the amount, what we hear from the departments, the, the level of accountability, and the document 
is tremendous. If you are interested in reading this budget document, first of all, the numbers are totally transparent. The detail is profound. I mean, it's a lot of detail. And the prose is very unusual for bureaucratic prose. It's clear, and it helps you understand. And I have been, this is only my second budget, not the, my 38th, I guess, Mr. Mayor. But um, I can just tell you that for a person who's coming to it fairly new, the level of information and the level of explanation that we get to try to make good decisions is, is terrific. And then what that leaves us with, and we spent the last, we spent two days last week, again, two full days together, hearing again from the departments, having read this book, more presentations, and then we flag for this coming Thursday, and we'll hear again from people tonight, we flag items that we will discuss on Thursday at the work session, and then we'll come together at our next meeting and approve the budget. And what I have come to realize is, of this, in terms of thinking about the consensus on the council and mainly the job that our manager and his staff has done in bringing this to us, is the budget's about $381 million. The items we flagged are about $2 million. So when you think about it, we've already come to agreement on about 379 of the $381 million. The other couple million dollars, we're talking about how do you fund it? Should we, the question was asked about the uh, solid waste fee versus taxes, for example. There's been questions about the bus fares. There are a few other items that we're talking about, Ellerbee Creek Trail. There are a few other items, and they're important items, which we have talked about, should we fund it, can we fund it, and how. But because of the work that our staff does, we already have reached a consensus on the vast majority of the budget. Um, it doesn't do everything that we wish because we don't have the money that we wish, but it is a, it is a, a great process. And I, uh, it, I have so much confidence in our staff, our finance staff, uh, our deputy city manager, Wanda Page, uh, Bertha Johnson, and all the staff that are putting this together. It has, it has just been a, it's been a great education for me, and I think that if you want to learn about our city, read this book. So I really do appreciate the work of our staff very much on this. Mr. Schubel, thank you. Ms. Katati. Yes. Um, so thank you, Anthony, for hosting this, and thank you to Budget and Public Affairs staff for putting this together, and especially thank you to the manager and management staff and all the departments for all the service that you provide to our citizens. You do a tremendous amount of work, and really under tightening resources. It's, this is my 10th annual budget, and we have had essentially less money for discretionary services over time. Um, I also want to thank the citizens for their very thoughtful emails and input. I tried to respond to all of them. I did not respond to the last 125 that came in since I left for work this morning. <laughs> so um, I look forward to the additional budget deliberations this Thursday and um, echo the comments of my colleagues. So um, thank you. Keep the input coming. Thank you. Mr. Moffitt. Did any of you leave me anything? Um, <laughs> I don't think so, but I'm sorry, you're going to bear with me for a moment. I'm going to tell you that uh, some of the things you've already heard, the budget is tied very closely to the city strategic plan, which is written through input from stakeholders like you, resident staff, partners against crime districts and others. Transparency and engagement are key values of this council in preparing the budget. It starts with coffees that are held around the city, um, conversations, it includes a visioning process to explore goals, projects and activities. Um, surveys are used to get more feedback and residents send emails and call with their input. Our process of engaging citizens' participation has been recognized nationally. And, and um, I thought I was going to get to do this, but even this got done. But I really want to uh, call out and uh, appreciate two of the architects of that process who are usually in the background and who put together tonight's E-Town e Hall meeting. That's Beverly Thompson. I want to give these guys a round of applause. Uh, Beverly Thompson, Stand the city's so public affairs office, and Bertha Johnson, who leads a terrific budget team. <laughs> and Anthony, I want to thank you for your, um, for your m moderation tonight. Thank you, Mr. Moffitt, and thank you for pointing out the architects. I was going to do the same thing. Beat me to it. Anthony, uh, uh, Council Member Katati pointed out to me they even coordinated their clothing. <laughs> yes. That's very important. Well, we have come to the end of this. Thank you all for joining us tonight electronically, especially those of you who came down to City Hall for this E-Town Hall. Hope we found it helpful. Now, in the event that your question was not addressed, make sure you visit the city's website, durhamnc.gov. The council will review all questions and suggestions 
and they will post responses. Now your continued involvement throughout the budget process is not only welcomed, it is also encouraged. Stay connected via the City of Durham's Facebook page, the Twitter page, and the website I just mentioned. All resources and documents referenced tonight regarding the budget can also be found at the budget page, which is on the city's website. Thank you again for all your questions, participation. Hope you have a wonderful evening. And uh, tomorrow, we'll be back after you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we are now going to move into the uh, public hearing part of the, the budget. And the process will be that this is a comment public hearing. Uh, we're here to hear your comments on, on the budget, proposed budget. Uh, persons have signed up to speak on the yellow cards. I would ask is that anyone else that uh, would like to speak at this, at this budget public hearing that is not signed up, if so, we ask you to go to the clerk's office, uh, clerk's desk to the left and uh, sign up. I have 15 persons that have signed up to speak on the uh, public hearing. Uh, in fairness to the fact that you're here and you've sat through it, uh, I'm going to say let's take three minutes each for your comments. That's uh, plenty. Uh, and if I, you don't use three minutes, uh, you can write something down and we, we'll follow up with it. So I'm, I'm going to call the uh, names. If you could come to the podium to the right, and uh, there's a clock in front of you. For those of you who have not uh, been here to speak before that will keep the time in terms of your speaking and again we don't yield time so you've got three minutes uh, to use we have Steve Corn is that Corn is that correct come to the right uh, Steve Hopkins Steve still around come to the right uh, Larissa Seibel uh, Aiden Riley Graham is that correct uh, Rena Hawkins Susan Brooks, Marie Eisen, Barbara Garrett, Tony Williamson, Sandu Dzimik, uh, Harry Sodwin, Godwin, Goodwin, okay, Jan Williams, Donna Rudolph, Victoria Peterson, Carl Riss. Uh, now, is there anyone else that would like to speak that uh, has not spoken? That's fine. <laughs> uh, so, Ms. Mr. Cohen, Cohen. Okay. Cohen. I'm here to talk, I hope one last time, about the funding for the extension of the West Ellaby Creek Trail, which you already had a question about. I'm the president of the Ellerby Creek Watershed Association, but in this matter, I also have the backing of many other groups and many other individuals. The Durham Open Space and Trails Commission, the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission, the East Coast Greenway Alliance, neighborhood associations in Old West Durham, Old North Durham, Watts Hillendale, and also an inter-neighborhood council representing all of Durham's neighborhoods have all passed resolutions in support of funding the construction of this trail as soon as possible. First, I want to thank Tom Bonfield for including in his proposed city budget an initial $75,000 to complete the right-of-way acquisition. And I especially want to thank Mr. Bonfield for making what I understand to be a firm commitment to fund the rest of Durham's portion of the construction money in the following year's city budget. These are big steps forward and we appreciate them. But second, I want to remind the council members that with a somewhat larger allocation this year, leaving less to fund in the following year, the city can get the process moving as quickly as possible to secure the federal matching money, more than a million dollars, that has already been approved for this project but not yet clinched. I know there have been questions and confusions about how long the easement acquisitions might take, but the trail supporters intend to do all in our power to help move that process along as quickly as possible and as smoothly as possible. If it gets done in six months or less, then we want to be ready to move on to the next steps, not meaning the project would move right into the construction phase, which we know is not possible yet at that point, 
and might jeopardize the federal funding but rather meaning the city would move right into the process of fully securing the federal funding that is needed for the construction to begin. What we definitely do not want to happen, what we fear, is for the million plus dollars of federal funding to fall through because the city did not move fast enough to put up its matching share. A commitment from the city manager is great, but that's not enough to secure a full commitment with federal funds. For that, as I understand it, the city's matching share needs to be fully budgeted. And as we all know from bad surprises of all sorts, stuff happens. Bad things for the trail funding can happen in the federal budget process or in the city budget process. The longer we wait, the more bad stuff can happen. By putting an additional amount, less than $200,000, into this year's city budget, rather than promising to put it into next year's city budget, put it all into next year's city budget, you will allow the process of securing the federal matching funds to begin as soon as possible, not a year from now, which could turn into two years from now, or 10 years from now, or never. Please don't take a chance of letting these approved federal funds slip away, because if that happens, this trail might never get built. That's why I'm asking you to commit the extra funds needed to secure the federal match this year. Let's make sure we get this trail built so bikers, walkers, runners, and commuters can benefit from it each and every day. Thank you. You're welcome. Steve Hopkins. Mr. Mayor, City Council, Steve Hopkins, 1117 Apartment 10, Gurley Street. And I usually don't break this head out, but with the new chancellor at Central, I'm an eagle, okay? All right. Uh, there's a couple of things. This budget is huge, and there's a lot of things that I need to say about a lot of things, which I'm not, but I'm going to pick out a couple of things that is really important to me. Uh, and I'm speaking as a private citizen. I don't represent any group, just me. And my biggest concern right now is our uh, impact team. You know, your measurements and everything said that they are doing a great job, and they are. But they can't keep up, folks. You know, there's weedy lots, boarded up buildings. They have to mow lawn. They have to do uh, graffiti and everything. And one seven-man team cannot keep up with all of them. Folks, we need another impact team to help keep Durham beautiful. You know. Secondly, jobs. You know, we can train folks and train folks and train folks, but if there's no jobs for those folks, we have a, a, a well-trained unemployment line. And there are work that needs to be done Nobody wants to pay to have it done. We need to get this work done. And I'm talking about mowing lawns, uh, boarding up uh, uh, houses, and these are jobs. And the federal government through their uh, AmeriCorps process will help with the, uh, uh, the stipends for these folks. We need to put people back to increase our tax base. Now we're getting jobs in and the bad thing about that is the employers that are coming in is bringing their staff with them. That's, what's, that's how it grows. The people that are here that are unemployed are still unemployed. They are not getting these new jobs because there's no new jobs really coming. The jobs are coming in, but they ain't bringing new jobs with them. And that's a sad fact. Now, uh, our housing stock is getting a little bit better, but we still haven't addressed the boarded up and dilapidated ones that we have, and we need to address that. And I'm asking the city to rethink some of your decisions in your budget. And hey, I don't mind you raising bus t bus fare if you put in parking meters. Thank you. Lisa Seibel. Hello, I'm Larissa Seibel, and this evening I've been asked to represent Durham Can, which is a group, a diverse group of. Uh, people who want the entire Durham community to benefit from the city budget. We know our city budget reflects our priorities, and we all want every person to have safe quality homes, as well as be able to get affordable transportation. But we may not know how critical these homes and transit are to the entire Durham community. The two largest expenses for residents of Durham um, our number one housing and usually number two is transportation 
and many individuals work more than one job just to be able to keep their homes. And as you know, a stable, healthy home is critical to the health of all of our residents and also critical to the success in school of our children. So try to uh, get to work without a car. Try to keep a car running on a minimum wage job. I know I, I have. The AAA says it costs about $9,000 a year for a car. That's $173 a week and $4.32 an hour. Durham is actually at a crossroads. Uh, with our budget, we can put the funds into continued suburban sprawl outside our transit system, outside of the reach of low-income residents to be able to get to jobs, or we can build quality, affordable homes along our existing bus lines and our proposed transit station. But we need to move forward now. We need to put money into planning affordable housing around transit stations and bus lines now before the land is all taken up with development. We need to put money into homes, affordable homes, for people with disabilities, seniors, homeless, veterans, and other extremely low-income residents so that people who use transit will support transit. And we need to keep transit affordable so everyone in our community can get to work, to school, medical care, and other things. I want to add one thing that Durham Can did not have time to address uh, before this meeting, but it appears that there's a proposal to eliminate a housing inspector, and in the past, Durham Can has strongly supported housing inspections to provide quality housing for all. And I hope that you will flag that item and uh, discuss it further and see if we can find some way to preserve that housing inspector. That would be the last position I would cut from Neighborhood Improvement Services. I appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Uh, Aiden Riley Graham. So I actually want to start by asking everybody to think back a couple hours to the downpour that happened around 6 o'clock. Uh, if you weren't actually in the downpour, just think about a downpour that you've been, you've been caught out in. And then actually, so think about that, and then imagine yourself down at the downtown station. I don't know if you've stood, like how many of y'all have stood at the, under the shelter at the downtown station, but I definitely have. And I know I often will like look around to try and find like a dry spot on the concrete where I can stand to get shelter. And unfortunately, there's not one there. So my name is Aiden Graham. I'm here with People's Durham. And I came to speak out against the proposed bus fare increase. Um, and I've actually spent the last three weeks, uh, me and some of the other people from People's Durham, talking to hundreds of riders who have signed this petition that I want to submit for the public record that says, each of the riders who signed this say no to the fare increase. They want you to hear this. They say no to the fare increase. They say no to service cuts. And they say, if the city really cares about what riders think, you have to give us enough time and information to really be able to give our opinions. So as I've had these hundreds of conversations with people down at the station, on the buses, uh, at the bus stops in the neighborhood, I've talked to folks who can't put an address on the petition, can't put a phone number on the petition because they have to make tough choices all the time about what bills they're gonna pay to survive month to month. They're living at the homeless shelter. That's the only address that they can put down here. So to me, these are not folks who can afford another $15 a month, and these are the folks who rely on the day pass to be able to get around to where they need to, to work if they have a job, to where they need to get food, um, to where they go to school even. Um, so that's, that's just one thing that I think is really important. And another story that I want to share is that one of, the, one of the folks that I talked to, a young man, tall, lean guy who was kind of standing off to the side at the station, I walked up to talk to him and a group of his friends. And uh, he looked at what I had and he said, you know, that's worth less than an ashtray, actually. And my immediate reaction was that my heart sank. And I took it personally, I'll admit. Like, when I walked away, I was like, ooh, I did a bad job. But then as I walked away, I realized he wasn't saying that I did a bad job. He was saying that he thought his voice doesn't matter. And him and his friends laughing 
That's actually heartbreaking to me. So I'm here because I believe, actually I know that many of you on city council believe that public transportation is really important, that you stand behind public transportation. And I have the hope that you're gonna hear these voices and think back to why, why is it that a multi-million dollar station downtown isn't able to protect you from the rain? It's because riders were not allowed enough input in the process where that building was designed. Thank you. Welcome. Irina Hawkins. Good evening, everybody. I'm also with People's Durham, here to oppose the bus fare increase. And um, my first experiences with riding public transportation was when I was a student at UNC. My first three years, I was a student there. I didn't have a car, so I had to depend on the bus to um, get from class to class and also to uh, go from Chapel Hill to my job in Durham. And um, I enjoyed the independence that working allowed, and I also was um, enjoyed the mobility of the bus system. And um, although I'm already graduated and I have a car now, I can still relate to the struggle that the Durham riders um, face. And um, I remember what it was like to not have an alternative and to be dependent on the bus to get everywhere. And um, I also was at the station um, listening to people's testimonies and um, hearing their stories and getting them to sign our petition. Um, and I. I love public transportation too. The buses ensure that Durham riders can keep their jobs, go to the grocery store, even go to a Durham Bulls game if they want to. And um, I think it's our responsibility, you know, to um, maintain the fare um, because it's exploitative. It targets the people at the bottom who have the least, who have the least money to um, to pay for this increase. And um, it just makes me think back to when I was a student in Chapel Hill, there is no bus fare. And um, I could go anywhere in campus, I could even come to Durham, and I didn't have to pay for anything. But my proposal isn't for a free fare, it's just I want a fair fare. Um, I want a fare that doesn't burden the riders any further. And I've experienced another system, and I know that it doesn't have to go up, there are other ways that the deficit can be met. And so I just want to um, ask you to vote against the fare increase. Thank you. You're welcome. That's Susan Brooks. Um, I'm here too to speak against the, uh, the proposed bus, in, bus fare increase, not with an organization, but pretty much as just a private citizen who has been using the bus system by choice, not because I have to. I've been using it for many years. I have been involved with the bus system when Data had their board of trustees, so I'm well aware of the many challenges that there are with funding a really, you know, world-class bus system, or at least one of the best in the state, and actually the southeast. So, so I know that, but to, to, uh, to have this uh, bus system funded mostly on the backs of an, any increase of the people who can least afford it does not seem to me the right thing to do. That seems to be the wave of what's happening now um, all across the country with many kinds of services. Uh, and, and the people who are writing data, not by choice, but because they have to, um, are people who are working minimum wage jobs mothers who are trying to get their kids to a school, maybe that's not their zoned public school, but it's a better one that they think is the right place for their children to be. And, um, you know, they're just for students, for instance, who happen not to be Duke students. I work at Duke and I'm very fortunate to have a go pass. I can ride the bus for free. Duke has made a lot of investment in that and I have taken advantage of it. So just to put this fare increase on the backs of the people who ride the bus, and as we all know, those are people who really are the least, who have the least funds, just doesn't seem right to me. Um, there are other ways to do that. Uh, a tax increase would be one, and one of you said, yeah, there are people who prefer, uh, 
for, uh, prefer, fa uh, what is it, uh, services, paying for services by the people who use it. There are others who prefer that everybody in the community pay for something that is a community resource, and this is a community resource. It's, and also if you want to attract more riders who can ride the bus if they want to but have a car sitting at home, upping the fare is not the way to do it. And there will also will be people, you'll, you may really um, uh, lower the ridership, there will be people who ride the bus and, and who will not be able to afford it. So I just think it's, it's not the right thing to do for those reasons. Durham is on its way to becoming a nationally recognized city um, in many ways. And having a really good public transportation, that's attractive to all of our community would be one way to do that. Um, so that's all I want to say. I'm not even going to take up my three minutes. I just <laughs> wanted to, thanks for hearing me. You're welcome. Uh, Marie Faison. <clears throat> Hello. My name is Marie Hill Faison, and I came tonight to uh, speak against the proposed fare increase. I attended two of the meetings uh, at the terminal, <clears throat> and I was very disturbed at the information that I received and um, about the uh, proposal for the increase for the buses. I, I work for paratransit, and I uh, transport uh, handicapped, elderly, uh, people on dialysis that depend on the service. So. I would like to commend you for uh, leaving the fair as it is because I see firsthand how people struggle to pay the fair. And uh, this is one area that we don't need to increase uh, the fare. And so I, I just like to say thank you and I appreciate it. I don't use the service myself, but I drive the vans and I transport the people that ride on there. and. It services a lot of people that really need it, and every day you hear uh, accolades of the service from the people. I mean, there's lateness and <laughs> there's a lot of problems, but the service is there, and that's pretty much what we have to keep going, no matter what. And uh, the buses is, is equally important, uh, because when people can't ride the paratransit, they need public transportation. And so I would just recommend that we try and expand our vision of what we see public transportation to be in the future and, and not try and uh, take away from that, but to add on to it. We have, um, uh, as was told before, we have an increasing elderly population. From what I see, there's a lot of people here that will probably be riding the van uh, still in the future because it, it it gives a service of independence for, for people, and uh, they're able to do things. And another disturbing thing at the meeting uh, that um, I, I heard was that with a fare increase for the buses, the, the ridership would go down, and that's the wrong direction. We don't want ridership to go down. We want to encourage people to ride it. I ride it. I go to other states and ride public transportation. I'm a firm believer in being able to get to where you have to go without a car. And, and the other good thing about public transportation is that it's uh, good for the environment. So what I'd like to see is more green thought for Durham and uh, encouragement for people that even have cars to ride public transportation. Let them know that it's efficient, it's safe, and it's the way to go, you know. And then we'll save our uh, environment. So. Thank you for listening to me, and I hope you'll uh, entertain that thought. Thank you. You're welcome. L let me call these names again. I'm calling them as they signed up. Barbara Garrett, Tony Williamson, Sanlo, Pisma, Harvey Goodwin, Jan Williams, Donna Rudolph, Victoria Peterson, Carl Riss, Lanier Blum, and Jim O'Reilly. Good evening. My name is Barbara Garrett. Um, I'm here to talk about the bus fare increase. Um, I'm a lifelong Durham uh, member of the Durham community. I'm a graduate from NCCU, uh, and I'm unemployed. 
uh, for me, on some days, is and I own my own vehicle. On some days, it's very hard for me to get the $2 that it takes for me to ride the bus. And so I'm asking that you all would not increase, would not allow them to increase the bus fare, to leave it as it is for people that's like myself, that are in a position um, at this time where we really can't hardly afford the $2 that it is at this time. And so I ask that you all consider it. Thank you. Welcome. Tony Williamson. I know I'm butchering this name, but is this Tony coming? Uh, Sandlo Pisma Pendola? No, no, I can't read that. No? So I wasn't originally going to speak. Well, what, uh, tell, tell me what is your name? My name is Sendolo Demina. Okay. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I wasn't originally going to speak. Uh, last time I did the public speaking in front of public officials was at the county commissioner meeting, and we got to yield time, so I was going to give some of our folks a little bit more. But um, I have been riding public transportation since I grew up uh, in Kalamazoo, Michigan. I rode the buses there in a town that's about the size of Durham. I rode public transportation in New York City, and I've been riding public transportation since I've been here in Durham. And you know, the the ritual of about to uh, going to get on the bus is going by the change thing by the door, right? And I have to get there a half an hour early because it's going to take me a little time to dig through, find the quarters or the nickels or the dimes or whatever. And the idea of adding another 50 cents to that for a day pass, right? Like it seems like a small amount. You think like 50 cents is not that much. But as somebody who goes through that process every day or around other people who go through that process every day, 50 cents actually does make a really big difference. And People's Durham, the organization that I work with, uh, our work is primarily with folks who are low income, mostly in the Haytai area in the south side, uh, south side, southeast Durham, right? And y'all know us from the Lincoln Apartments fight, right? Um, I was walking down the street the other day and I ran into two people who came from Lincoln Apartments. Miss Barbara is, is one of those folks, right? Um, but there was another young lady who, who was walking down the street and what struck me in a conversation I was having with her is just all the different things that are coming down on top of our folks right now. Right? And y'all know that as people who are working at the local level trying to build a city that's progressive. Um, but on the everyday level, there are so many things that are happening to our folks, and adding even small pieces is tremendous. Right? So what we're asking folks to do here is to think about not just a small number, right, but the impact that that has on somebody's everyday life. The other thing I want to say is that a public transportation system isn't just for poor people. I am a poor person. I want to have a public transportation system that I can afford. But a good public transportation system is actually the blood system for a good city. Right? And right now, you go to 147, you see that blood system working through cars. We want to see that working through buses. Y'all have said you want to see that working through trains, right? We believe that a public transportation system that's based on buses and that puts forward riders is what's really going to build that blood system, that heart, for the kind of city that we want to live in. Thank you. Harvey Goodwin. Yes, I'm Harvey Goodwin, and thank you. Um, I come today uh, back to budget, too. <clears throat> And I'm a taxpayer, and I come as a person that uh, that represents the people that are that have, are retired and on Social Security. They're not getting any raises, and people that is unemployed. Uh, I just like to go over this. <clears throat> a budget is more than just a budget. A budget is made up of the salaries. A budget is made up of the work they do. A budget is made up of the waste. A budget is made up of many things. And I want to go over one first. <clears throat> I want to go over the um, managers, 
Bond, uh, manager Bonfield Fowler. Mr. Goodwin, could, could you pull your microphone a little bit over so we Yes. Can... Uh, 185192 Deputy Chadwell, 143575 20 Deputy Ferguson, 140000 Wanda Page, 146087 And the car allowance is over probably 18000 Also, they get hospital insurance, sick days, um, holidays, and whatever. And uh, just the budget on this was $668,785. <clears throat> and that's almost, that's over a half a million dollars. That's high for a budget. Okay, the next is the city attorney. Baker makes $182,694. And the raise I think he got was $3,581.41. These people that are out is paying the taxes are struggling. They cannot pay their light bill. They cannot get their medicine. They are not getting raises. They're not getting bonuses like the city has got bonuses. They get bonuses, they get raises. That's not fair for the city taxpayers. They cannot afford it. Uh, the fee, assistant attorney, $112,026.15. See, senior, Attorney, $118,354.29. And um, the, the assistant, <coughs> he got a uh, raise of $5,500. And then the uh, other senior assistant, he got $2,321. Then assistant, assistant, <coughs> attorney, $102,421.18. And he got a bonus, I mean a raise or whatever, $6,695. <clears throat> the next senior assistant, $112,299.01. His, his uh, increase was $5,500. I'm going to speak for my husband. I'm going to go fast. No, Ms. <laughs> Ms. Goodwin, uh, huh? we, we don't yield time. What I would suggest, I think we get the trend of where you're going. I'm you, sorry? I said we don't yield time. Okay. Past, but, but if you like, you can leave your notes with the clerk. It'll be okay. a part of the record, and I think we understand okay. your concern, salaries. Well, I'd just like to say, too, that the, these, um, talking about the sewer. As, 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 if you don't mind, Ms. Goodwin, you've really gone okay. over your time. You can leave your information with the clerk, okay. and any other remarks, leave that with him also. And we'll okay. get part Thanks. of this meeting. Thank you. Uh, Jan Williams. My name is Jan Williams, and I am Program Director of Healthy Families Durham. We serve about 150 families of young children. We do home visits, and all of these families are low-income families who are struggling to make ends meet every single day. So I'd like for you to think of me representing these 150 families. I realize what a tight position the city is in related to the transportation budget. And I realize that some of the bus fares will need to increase. But I am here to speak specifically against that 50 cent increase on the $2 day pass. Over the 16 years that I've been doing this work, I am convinced that that $2 daily pass is the one most frequently used by our lowest income citizens. Many of the families in my program use this daily pass to get to their pediatrician's appointments, their WIC appointments, to Department of Social Services, to mental health appointments, to their work, and to Durham Tech. Though a $10 a month increase, 50 cents a day, might not sound like much to us, for some families, this is a 25% increase that would take money away from diapers, formula, food, and clothing for their children. And unfortunately, many families do not have the $20 all at once to purchase a multi-pass. I know that they could save money by doing that, but they just don't have that $20 all at once. So I also have a question. I think about sometimes at my work, we hop on the Bull City Connector to go eat lunch at Brightleaf or to go downtown, and we pay nothing. So I have a question about why would we not charge something for that Bull City Connector 
instead of raising the increase, making an increase that penalizes our lowest income citizens. So I really ask that you reconsider that 25% increase on the $2 day pass because I think it penalizes the people who can least, least afford it. And I'm here to represent them, so thank you. Donna Rudolph. I don't know how we do this because I have two hats tonight. And so do I um, have a... No, you have three minutes. Three minutes? Three minutes. Okay. As Donna... All right. Uh, yeah, so three minutes as Donna Rudolph. Okay. Um, <laughs> starting... Now, I'm Donna Rudolph, and I live uh, on 751 South in the subdivision of Eagles Point at about as far as the city goes. But I'm concerned about the city, the whole city. It's my city. It's where I am pleased to call home. And I'm concerned about homelessness. And I'm a member of the Housing Committee of People's Alliance. And on behalf of People's Alliance, I want to draw your attention to the fact that a count of homeless people made in January revealed 759 homeless persons. 93 of those were homeless veterans and 87 of them were chronically homeless individuals. And several advocacy groups have s stated a goal to end homelessness in Durham in the next 10 years, uh, within 10 years, and uh, for veterans and chronically homeless persons by th the year of 2015. So we're asking in order for these people to be able to call Durham their home, that the, the city budget in the fiscal year of 2013-2014 allocate $750,000 to build new supportive housing for extremely low income people with a priority for homeless veterans and people with special needs, people who are disabled, and for those who are chronically homeless. Now, I want to speak about a development that's proposed on 751 South. And I, <coughs> my main concern personally is getting out on 751 because I can't get home if I don't use 751 and the traffic's already rather intense uh, several times a day on 751 South. And if you use the statistics of the last census and the number of cars per people per home, 1,300 housing units in this Southern Durham development will produce about 2.2 cars per household. So I, I'm looking at probably 3,000 car trips coming in and 3,000 car trips coming out a day th beyond what are already on 751. So there's that cost to r uh, build and maintain a highway. But the, one, the items I'm most appalled at, I don't see how in good conscience Durham can approve this development because there are 80 of this 166 acres, 81 of those acres will be paved over and the carcinogenic runoffs from asphalt paving into the lake, which J Jordan Lake is the water source for fi 500,000 people. And I think you can, th the other matter that is astonishing to me is if you allow this development to occur, then how can you say no to other developments that, do, that violate the existing environmental standards and density statements? Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Victoria Peterson. Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, for the uh, e-commerce, you will sort of allow uh, the city council members to answer questions and I, I just have really one question that I would just like to ask, um, particularly the city manager, why Ms. are Ms. we Pe losing Ms. money? Ms. Peterson, uh, oh, this well, is a public hearing for comments. Okay, well, I would like to still ask and somebody can write me back, why is the city losing monies again? Uh, this is the second year that we are losing monies on revenue, at least from what is in the report. And I remember last time the city, uh, the city manager gave the report, uh, our revenue dollars were down uh, on the last budget. Uh, but I would like to just share this, um, uh, Mr. Mayor and city council members. I still have, and I, I live in this community, 
And uh, a lot of folks talk to me uh, about the crime and other issues. And someone on the council stated that the crime was going down in Durham. If crime was going down in Durham, then somebody really needs to call the county commissioners. Because we just built a $64 million courthouse. You don't build a courthouse and you don't expand your jail because crime is going down. I really think that this community really needs to look at bringing on a new police chief. Yes. I'm tired of the shooting, the killings, the murderings, the stealing, the breaking into the houses that's going on in this community. There is something terribly, terribly wrong with the part two crimes. I know the, the police chief brings in the part one crimes. And I've told you numerous times, you need to ask him about the part two crimes. When you add the part one and you add the part two, we're talking about close to 20,000 crimes that are being committed in this community annually, yearly. We have a huge population of young men that are unemployed in this community. If you cannot work, you're not taking care of your family and you're not taking care of your children if you don't have jobs. We have all these projects that has come into this community, and very few, and I'm hearing it, even from the African-American general contractors and contractors. Uh, Ms. Peterson, we hear you down here, we see you. Somebody needs to tell the mayor that we are not getting the jobs. Go across the street to your huge project that is going on today in this community, and you're gonna see very few young men in this community working on that project. We have a police department that, has, that is asking for $52 million, $52 million. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of crime money. Do you know what we can do with $52 million right, in this Peterson, community? Ms. Peterson, you have three but minutes. But anyway, is Mr. Up. Mayor, three so minutes is up. I'm just asking that we, we really we, we look heard, at this you. budget we and the you. police chief. Thank we you, need Ms. a Peterson. new one. Thank you. And thank you, sir. You're quite welcome. Carl Riss. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, my name is Carl Rist. I live at 809 Watt Street, and I'm here representing the Durham People's Alliance. We are 700 members strong in Durham and growing. I have three recommendations for you, three brief recommendations for you regarding next year's city budget. Number one, the city council should support modest funding for supportive, stable, safe housing for extremely poor residents. As my colleague from the People's Alliance just said, we recommend the council fund at least $750,000 per year to provide supportive homes for residents with special needs. This is a smart investment to help end homelessness in Durham and to ensure that all can call Durham home. Secondly, the city council should oppose the proposed $18 annual fee, garbage fee, because it hurts working families. A fair approach would be to increase property taxes by a half cent per thousand dollars of value per home. This would raise the same amount of money, but cost the owner of a hundred thousand dollar house only five dollars per year. If your home is valued at less than three hundred and sixty thousand dollars per year, you would pay less than eighteen dollars per year. Third, as many here tonight have said, the city council should oppose the proposed increase in bus fares because it too hurts working families. We've spent the past ten years moving in the right direction toward more free public transit. Now is not the right time to shift direction. Public transit doesn't pay for itself any more than highways and roads and bridges do. We should be investing in options that support non-drivers as much as we invest in options that support drivers. So again, I urge the council to oppose the proposed bus fare increase. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Lanier Bloom. Uh, Jim O'Reilly. Yes, Jim O'Reilly. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm here to talk about Durham housing for people in poverty, uh, along with Lanier Blum, who will uh, uh, present the second half of this. Uh, Durham's five-year community development plan has two priorities. One is housing for extremely poor households. Many of these neighbors, uh, may, many of these neighbors suffer disabilities and so require supportive services to maintain a stable, decent home. 
a 2009 HUD report found that in Durham, 7,800 extremely poor households rent deficient dwellings and or dwellings they can't afford. In January of this year, Durham counted 759 people with no home at all, 706, 706 live in temporary shelters, and 53 at si outside. Housing is the key to health, not only of individuals and families and of neighborhoods, they're, they're the practical key to the health of communities. Studies have, repeat, have repeatedly documented that the public cost of providing stable, decent, and supportive housing is far lower than responding to the damaging consequences that go along with being homeless. For example, in, in Los Angeles, they found the average cost of supportive housing is $605 a month whereas the typical cost of a similar homeless person is $2,900, five times greater than their counterparts who are housed. For the next five years, from all sources, the city has so far allocated funding for building up to 45, only 45 homes for very low-income renters, 16 in Rolling Hills, four in Southside, and up to 25 for seniors at Witted Schools. That's less than 10 a year. For uh, this year, the community development budget published in November requested proposals for up to 250,000 of dedicated housing funds for supportive housing. This 250,000 is, is, is the only funding now allocated for supportive and very low income housing. That amount, if leveraged, might add about five permanent dwellings. So what can we do if Durham's very um, key priority is to end homelessness and especially of veterans and chronically homeless individuals and people with disabilities and families by 2015 and to end homelessness in 10 years and if it's one of the two priorities of our community development budget, what can we do? In 2013 and 14, in addition to the funds the city has reserved for Whitted School, the city should now allocate from the dedicated housing uh, fund $768,000 to build new supportive housing and housing for people with extremely low incomes. According to the Community Development Department budget, these funds are and will be available, but they have not yet been allocated for this or any other named purpose. So please allocate that money for this purpose, very low income housing. And until Durham does reach its goal of ending homelessness, the city and county's five year community development budget should continue to allocate at least $750,000 a year for extremely low income households. Along with funding housing, Durham should preserve existing housing, new housing, Durham should preserve existing housing that is well managed and affordable to people with incomes below 30% of area median. To expedite this development, we need the city to put forth and adopt a process with a predictable schedule that will um, allocate these resources and select projects. These funds need to be carried forward from one year to the next so that the city and its partners can plan development of varied sizes. This policy will support a range of projects that meet the diverse needs and opportunities of different types of housing in different neighborhoods. This strategy will enable high performance, accountable, nonprofit local providers to plan and propose viable developments that will remain affordable for decades to come. The county and city should also maintain and build on the coordinating and coordinate resources for health care and supportive services for homeless and extremely low income residents. In addition, Durham really needs policies that, that include and encourage supportive housing in all new large developments, particularly those for which local and state agencies are providing financial and infrastructural assistance. We have, for example, just completed this whole big plan for the transit station area in West Durham. There are thousands of new units built and planned. There is not a single low-income 
affordable dwelling in that project. But we can change that. Also, we need to prioritize the location near transit so that the people who need transit the most and housing the most have access to each other. Thank you so much. It's really good to see you. Let me ask, is it anyone else that has <coughs> not spoken that would like to speak on this, the public hearing on the proposed budget? Is it anyone else? Uh, let the record reflect that no one else asked to speak. Uh, I will close the public hearing on the proposed 2013-2014 budget. Uh, entertain a motion to accept comments uh, that have been presented. Second. second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? You close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Now, the next item on the agenda was to move to item 20. Just, yeah, before, before you do that, Steve. Uh, was to move to the economic item 819. Um, item 25 was the consult was the proposed bus fare increases and I, when I started out early I indicated that if people wanted to make comments on that item uh, during the public hearing for the budget it would be appropriate to do that I, I want to find out is there anyone else that wants to speak on the proposed bus fare increases Okay, the reason I'm asking is after Steve makes his comments, uh, I'm going to move to the proposed bus fare increases as a public hearing item, open it, uh, accept persons that want to speak. I understand that no one else wants to speak, uh, but, and I'll close the public hearing. But the point is, is there anyone else that wants to speak on it? Okay. All right, Steve. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to make a few comments on, on what I heard tonight and um, because we're going to be thinking about this on Thursday and afterwards. And the first thing I want to talk about is the housing. I, um, what I want to say is that we have the money in the budget and it is allocated. And we've had, we had a great discussion about that at the council meeting, uh, the council meetings last week in which it was, you know, we asked many questions of our, of our community development people. The penny has created a pot of money, as it was intended to do, for people, housing providers, to come forward with their projects. Um, there are two categories and, um, that I think are particularly relevant. One of them is the match gap financing with people, homeless people with special needs, and the other is the match gap financing for projects with uh, for uh, the low income housing tax credit. And these could be, this could be mixed income projects. And so let me give you some sense of how much that is because I think this is important. Uh, just to look at the, uh, there's a roughly a quarter of a million dollars uh, each year in the match gap financing for housing with persons with special needs, specifically for that. Uh, in fiscal year, in the, in the match gap financing for the low income housing tax credit, uh, Fiscal year 15, there's over $840,000. Fiscal year 16, there's 1.6 million. Fiscal year 17, 1.7 million. Fiscal year 18, 1.9 million. And staff has made it abundantly clear that that, that that money is available for these projects to come forward. And so what I would really like to do now, because I think it's really important that we kind of reassess this, is challenge the housing community to come forward with these projects. If you want us to fund these projects, they are there, the money is there, and it's really time for the housing community to come forward with these projects, and then we can help. We're all willing to fight for projects that will help the homeless that can use this money, especially mixed income projects, which I think we all know are the holy grail. But we cannot do that building. It could be the housing authority and it could be the nonprofit providers. But I, I really feel very strongly that we need to shift this, the thinking that we have about this now. There is a pot of money here. 
and I know that I will go to bat for those projects, and I know that other council members, my colleagues, will go to bat for these projects. If the projects come forward that, are, that, have, that, that we can use to leverage private financing and other government financing, such as the low-income housing tax credits. And so I, I, I just want to challenge our community, and especially our housing providers, of which we have this wonderful group, whether it be the housing authority or the nonprofit providers, to come forward with projects. And, um, I do think we have a process. Uh, you know, I, I, I am concerned that we only have the October deadline. We may need a second deadline every year. I know the Community Development Department is thinking about that, uh, which they discussed with us so that we would have a second opportunity for people to apply during the year. Uh, but uh, that's something we can deal with if people will come forward with projects. The other thing I want to say is, I would just mention a couple of other things. I, I really appreciate the I really appreciate the fact that we gave the manager a task and he did it, which was come in with a balanced budget with no tax increase. Um, and what he did was he, he took uh, he, he, he took all the tools at his disposal both to cut costs. And I want, I want to say something. People talked about pay and job positions. There's 16 job positions in this budget that are going to be eliminated. Most of them only four of those people, those jobs are, create, are filled now, so there won't be layoffs. Those people are going to be moved to other jobs. But I just want to make clear what the manager did in terms of efficiencies in this budget. Again, cutting a very lean staff to make it even leaner. And that makes it harder on our other employees, but those were decisions that were made. One of the things that he did, and, the, and, 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 I, and I give him the credit, but I give our whole staff the credit, is to move some of that money into our bus service. So about $1.1 million, or about half a cent worth of your tax dollars, has been moved from other things in this budget into the bus service. So most of the way we're filling the hole in the bus service is through general fund money already. And I want to commend and I want to thank the manager for that. I do think, I do think that the $240,000 that we're trying to fill through the day pass, we should not be filling that way. And my hope is that we'll be filling that through, uh, I would much rather fill, fill that through general fund money uh, and I'll get to that in just a second. Similarly with the solid waste fee. There's no question in my mind that it's regressive for homeowners, and I also am convinced that it's regressive for renters. It does exempt renters in large apartment complexes, but not those people in smaller uh, rental units, and uh, I, could, I will be showing some of my, in fact, I've already sent my colleagues today some math that uh, Mark Hellman, a very committed Durham citizen, did in terms of the regressivity for renters of the fee versus, versus some, versus the tax. And the other thing I want to say about the, about the, about the, gar, the, the solid waste fee is this. Interestingly, it's also in many ways not helpful for those people at the top end of the income spectrum, and here's why. If you have an $18 solid waste fee and you're an itemizer, you, you itemize taxes, which uh, the most tax, about 30% of American taxpayers itemize, and of those 30%, they're obviously at the higher end of the tax range. Those people can't deduct that from their taxes. They can't deduct that $18 fee from their taxes. But if you are an itemizer, and you have, are paying the property tax instead, you can deduct that from your taxes. So if you're in the 35% uh, tax bracket, you can uh, deduct $6.30 of your $18 fee from your taxes. So not only is it regressive and does it hurt people at the lower end of the income spectrum more, but it also, I think, in the long run, financially is not advantageous, it's disadvantageous to the people at the higher end of the income spectrum. So that if you own one of those houses, those over $360,000 houses in which you might have a break-even point uh, between the tax and the fee, but that's not true anymore if you count the, count the deductibility of the property tax versus the non-deductibility of the fee. All of a sudden, the value of the house that you would have to have goes even much higher than that. So not only is it regressive, but it hurts people even at the higher end of the income spectrum. So I, want, I really hope my colleagues will consider that as we go forward. Um, and of course, we have the Ellerby Creek Trail on the table, and I think Diane did a great job of describing the information that we need to get. And I am hopeful that if we need to fund that, this year to be able to get the additional money that we will make that decision. And we will find out about the timetable on that on Thursday. And I know the staff is going to give us some great guidance on that. And then I also wanted to say something about employee pay. We, we, wanted, to we wanted to raise our employee pay 
higher, we wanted 3%, that was our original guideline, and the manager you know, came in with a very responsible decision to, to raise it 2% because that's what, that's what we could bear. But I am very hopeful that we can do more than that. And I would like to at least be able to give something like a mid-year bonus if we can't raise the base pay more than the 2% budgeted. I think our employees deserve it, and I would like to be able to do it. And then finally, I want to say something about how to fund it. It would not be responsible of me to advocate against a, 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 a solid waste fee increase and, and a bus fare increase without talking about how to pay for it. And the way we need to pay for it is property taxes. No one wants a property tax increase. But for less than a penny, we could, we could, do the, we could cover the, the day fare pass increase, we could cover the solid waste fee, we could, we could fund the Ellerbee Creek additional money if it does become clear that it is necessary. And, uh, and we, could, we could give our employees another small bump. We can do all that for less than a penny. Durham is in its golden age. That's what we're in now. People want to come here. And one of the reasons they want to come here is that we invest. And if we're going to invest publicly, we have got to be able to pay for it. And people have got to be willing to pay for it, to pay for the services that we need. We don't want to be the highest tax people around, but we want to be able to tax it so that we can build the infrastructure that we need. We want our streets paved and we want them well paved. We want trails. We want good parks. We want ball fields. These are amenities that people want. We want a really good bus system. And if we want these things, then we need to invest in them. And I think we can make the case because I think that's what's going to make us a great city. And I think it's at times when you are in a time of prosperity, which Durham is relative to the rest of the country and will continue to be, when you're in a time of prosperity and when you're in that golden age, that's when you invest. Because we, can, we will have the money to invest. Let's invest. Let's, let's do the kind of infrastructure creation that we want. We are invested in our affordable housing. We're ready to do it. Okay, let's, let's build it. And so, like I say, for less than a penny, we can do all the things that I think we want to do in this budget without having to raise the fees that are aggressive. I know this is not an opinion shared by all my colleagues, and I know that there will be differences on these various items, but um, I, I just think that we have a real opportunity here and that we ought to think about, um, we ought to think about the big picture about our budget and, uh, and try to fund it in a way that's, that's uh, progressive. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, that's a very healthy commentary, and uh, I'm sure when we get into our discussions Thursday, we'll have a, a few more. Uh, the only comment I would, I would make uh, at this time is, uh, no, we don't want to be the highest tax uh, city around. And I, I think uh, one of the reasons that we are where we are is because uh, some of the other cities provide services not through their property tax, but through lease fees. And I just think we need to look at where we are relative to what other cities are doing and make a judgment. Do we want to continue down the path that we're doing, uh, providing everything out of property taxes, or do we want to provide it out of some of these fees, which we find some of the other cities are doing? But we have that discussion Thursday if you try, try to get there. Uh, having said that, the uh, public hearing has been closed with the comments. Uh, I am going, I know people are waiting here, but I'm trying to, trying to move it along so we can get it out. I'm going to open the proposed bus fare increase, which is item 25 to conduct a public hearing to receive comments on the proposed bus fare increases. Uh, I'm going to open the public hearing. I'm going to ask, is there anyone that wants to speak on this particular item? I recognize Victoria Peterson. Is there anyone else who wants to speak? I, I, don't want to, I don't want to go through that. I really don't. Uh, if Victoria wants to speak, is there anyone else who wants to speak? Uh, if not, Victoria, you have three minutes. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, last year uh, a lot of folks here in the community who were volunteering and persons who were being paid, um, we, were, we were out in the community um, uh, registering persons uh, to vote. And one of the places that we worked was, was over at the bus area. And it was shocking to me. Um, and I would just like to make some suggestions on how I think uh, the city could actually generate some income. That whole second floor is empty. It's built up, but there's, uh, I believe, uh, the police department or, or there may be a private 
uh, officers that go up there and, and walk around, but that hole upstairs is empty. We have persons who are outside who vendor. Why not allow them to come inside, rent a space very reasonable, and start, gener start generating some income off the upstairs, off the upstairs in the bus station? Because there's nothing going on upstairs. And, and you have that huge space up there. Also, I'm not sure if the Greyhound or the, um, the Bull City bus and the mega bus that sort of sits on the outside. I'm not sure if they pay rent or not. Uh, if they don't, they should. Uh, we have the Greyhound that goes in there. We had the mega uh, and they come there, what, two and three times a day with all their clients. Bring them inside, rent space to them. To me, these are ways of generating income where we may not have to raise uh, the fees at all, Mr. Mayor. Also, I agree with the young man. Some of us stood out there in that hot sun. Uh, how that thing is built, the, uh, it's not long enough to even deal with the sun. Uh, even if you sat out there on a nice day, that sun just cooks you. <laughs> so I heard the gentleman complaining about the rain. You get wet, but you also get baked also when the sun is high and bright. But thank you, Mr. Mayor. Anyone else that wants to speak on this item? This has been the um, fare increases for public transportation. Uh, let the record reflect that no one else asked to speak. I'm going to close the public hearing with the understanding that the comments made relative to fare increases during the budget public hearing will be folded into the uh, public hearing we're just closing out on bus fares. And when the council meets Thursday, uh, as we go through this, this uh, discussion, uh, the manager can have the staff to present the bus fare as a pre presentation that they were going to do this evening. Uh, that being the case, we're going to move open. Madam, Madam Clerk, I entertain a motion to close the public hearing. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Well, now we're going to move back to item 2019, which is the public hearing on the proposed economic development incentive agreement between GE Aviation and the City of Durham outside the community development area and within the city limits. Uh, with staff person Kevin Dick, Director of Office of Economic and Workforce Development. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good evening, Mr. Mayor. Uh, City Council, members of staff and Durham stakeholders. I'm Kevin Dick with the Office of Economic and Workforce Development, and I uh, am appreciative of the opportunity this evening to present a proposed economic development incentive agreement that would be executed between the City of Durham and GE Aviation. I also want to take a moment to recognize my colleagues from the Durham Chamber of Commerce, uh, President and CEO Casey Steinbacher, Vice President for Economic Development, Ted Connor, um, and uh, certainly recognize their recent um, recognition and award from the World Chambers Federation. Congratulations again for that. I also want to take the time to introduce um, representatives from GE Aviation, Mr. Mike Wagner and Eric Madison. They're seated in the front row here representing GE this evening. And uh, I'd like to point out that my presentation this evening will consist of a short video about GE Aviation and then a few informational slides that will just provide a little bit of clarity about the um, proposed incentive agreement.
was fascinated by uh, balsa wood airplanes ever since I was a kid, just throwing them around whenever I could. I always wondered how everything worked. How did an airplane get in the air? To design and create the next greatest thing it takes a lot of imagination and a lot of courage. I always wanted to be one of those guys that had that kind of responsibility and that kind of you know, technical expertise. At GE Aviation, we build jet engines. We lift people up off the ground to 35,000 feet in the air. These engines are built by hand with very precise assembly techniques. I definitely feel responsible for these customers. You can't pull over on the side of the road and see what's going on underneath the uh, hood. These have to be perfect every time. We make jet engines, and I think the, the inner nerd in me is really excited about that. When you build one up, wrap it up in plastic, and out the door it goes, and you know that out there somewhere, this machine you've made is serving an even bigger purpose. GNX is the latest and greatest. It's, it's the edge of technology. It's going to fly people around the world safely and, and better than it's ever done before. We are building engines that are literally making the world smaller. We build this engine up, but never get to experience its glory. See and smell and, and touch, you know, your life's work. I would love to see this thing fly. It's been eight years since I stood on a runway, since I've been putting them together. It's, it's a dream, honestly. Here it is today, we're gonna go out and see it. Fruits of all our labor. I think a lot of people, when they look at a jet engine, they see a big hunk of metal. But when I look at it, I see Seth, Mark, Kareem, and Tom, and people like that who work on engines every day. Just keep going in. A few feet right there. That's where my part is. People say there's no such thing as perfect. They don't make jet engines. They come out here and, and actually see my baby strapped to the bottom of somebody else's, and those creative energies coming together to make such an awesome product is just a real treat. To see that thing on an airplane and flying around, if you work at GE Aviation, it doesn't get any better. And now for the brief presentation. Um, GE is a global leader in jet engine and aircraft, aircraft system production. Uh, the company produces engines and parts for the airline industry. And they have a major manufacturing presence here in Durham, uh, off Miami Boulevard in an area adjacent to the Research Triangle Park. Uh, they are considering, um, uh, considering a, a significant investment across North Carolina uh, in new technology. Uh, this technology would lead to increased fuel efficiency in jet engine aircraft, and better fuel efficiency means increased economic and environmental benefits. The local investments they're planning, combined with additional investments in advanced manufacturing technologies, uh, would uh, 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 eventually amount to more than $200 million uh, in North Carolina operations by the end of 2017. Uh, $29 million would be invested in the Durham facility uh, over the next five years. This project will create 50 jobs within three years at average wages of $60,000 per year plus benefits. And uh, statewide, the project is expected to create a total of 250 additional jobs, including those in Durham, by 2017. The capital improvements um, that are planned, those 29, the $29 million investment, uh, is expected to yield $557,000 in new tax value over a five-year period. Uh, we are proposing an, an incentive payment of 400000 to be paid out over five years between fiscal years 16 and 20, which would yield a net of 157000 in net tax revenues to the city. Um, this dollar amount is part of a statewide incentive package that has the involvement of not only the North, North Carolina Department of Commerce, but four other municipalities. 
And I do want to point out, particularly in light of many of the comments tonight, that no funds would be paid out until the uh, thresholds are met. In other words, the capital investment thresholds and the job creation thresholds. These benchmarks must be met and they must be verified by staff. GE has, has indicated to the state uh, and, and to us uh, locally that they would be considering moving this manufacturing technology um, into greenfield areas in the Midwestern United States uh, if the incentive package from North Carolina were not uh, offered to them. And the Durham package is part of that statewide package. Uh, as I stated, the company must provide the city with documentation to, to prove expenditures on the aforementioned capital investment amounts. The company must complete and return the workforce development plan that would utilize the Durham Joblin Career Center system as a source of recruitment. This is an opportunity or this would be a vehicle by which we uh, provide Durham residents uh, opportunities to recruit for, uh, to be recruited for the 50 new positions. I do also want to also, I also want to point out that with the manufacturing technology that would be um, produced in North Carolina, it provides the opportunity for further growth uh, with the Durham assembly plant that's off Miami Boulevard. So not only would the 50 jobs uh, be created, um, there would also be other opportunities for Durham residents in the future um, as more manufacturing technology um, is uh, produced in North Carolina and then assembled um, at the Durham plant. To further um, the process of documentation collection, the company must provide to the city a certified copy, copy of the company's employment insurance filings with the North Carolina Department of Commerce Division of Employment Security. This proves job creation. And so in summary, we believe this project will uh, provide the opportunity to manufacture cutting-edge technology in Durham, uh, provide 50 new jobs at competitive wages uh, with the opportunities to produce more perhaps if uh, technology continues to be robust, the opportunities for Durham talent to find employment and for Durham businesses to uh, compete for contracts uh, related to the capital investment and expansion, and finally significant tax, uh, new tax revenues to the city. free for questions at this time if there are any. Thank you. Again, this is a public hearing item. I would ask first of the comments or questions by members of the council on this item. If not, is there anyone in this public that would like to speak on this item? Recognize whoever wants to speak, uh, if you can come up and How many speakers do we have? Well, there's two chamber folks, and I'm guessing. Uh, okay. Board I'm trying to figure out the time. That's why I'm asking. So is anyone else who wants to speak? We've got three people that are speaking. Uh, in that case, uh, let's try four minutes each and see where we go. I'm geared for two. Three's fine. <clears throat> Good evening, members of the Durham City Council and the uh, Durham City staff. I'd like to recognize and thank uh, Mike Wagner and Eric Madison, uh, GE Aviation Managers, for joining us tonight and sitting through our, our interesting meeting. <clears throat> it needs to be said that manufacturing is not dead in Durham. It has grown significantly in the past 10 years as we, as we have seen expansions at Merck, at Cree, at AW North Carolina, and now again, hopefully, at GE Aviation. It would, it would surprise a lot of folks here in Durham to know that the largest growth in Durham's gross domestic product, or GDP, over the last 10 years has been in manufacturing, which has increased 170%. The really exciting part of this number is that the leading edge technologies have really helped fuel this growth in, in our GDP. Just looking back a little bit, a little view in history, in 1993, Durham brought its aviation division to a to a Durham facility which had been vacant for several years. It's a mammoth facility that had been vacant and at that point began assembling a, the CF6 engine. Over time, GE, adds, GE, ha, GE has added new engines for assembly, such as the newer and much larger GE90 and new Gen X engine that powers the Boeing Dreamliner. 
GE's Durham plant is the forefront, or I should say is at the forefront of manufacturing processes delivered and developed by GE Aviation. Currently, when new engines are developed, assembly generally takes place here in Durham. The Gen X engine is currently the cutting edge, smart and fuel efficient engine of the time and leads the industry. But GE is already working on a new engine for the future knowing, known as the leading edge aviation propulsion, that's a tough one, or LEAP engine. This engine uh, really represents the next generation of smart fuel efficient engines in the world which we hope will be assembled when it's ready in Durham. Today, GE employs 320 assembly workers, 35 staff members, and more than 50 contractors as a team to assemble the best jet aircraft engines in the industry. And it was brought to my attention uh, recently that during its history here in Durham, GE Aviation has never laid off one of its workers, even during some lean times. I should also add, and as Kevin noted, that uh, GE Aviation will be investing up to $30 million, which will be generating some sufficiently or, or some uh, substantial new tax revenue for Durham. What we ask the Durham City Council tonight is to approve the incentive for GE Aviation tonight in order to push this project forward and hopefully it will land in Durham. Thank you. Uh, Casey Steinbacher. Mayor, members of council, thank you uh, so much for the opportunity to address you. Uh, on behalf of the Greater Durham Chamber of Commerce, I'm Casey Steinbacher, President and CEO. And you heard Ted a few minutes ago talk about the production and activities that go on actually in the GE facility. But I think equally as important as you get to know this company is, is uh, that there are much more than just engines. You get the opportunity to really uh, get to know the people that work there. When GE actually started uh, that new plan, it organized the production process within that assembly uh, facility around self-directed work teams composed of 15 team uh, members. Um, other than the work teams, uh, there's, a plan there's obviously some administrative staff that work there, but everyone actually belongs to a team, and the work team really addresses the whole comprehensive process of the assembly of the engine. Uh, which includes you know, human resource issues, supplier issues, vendor issues, engineering challenges, uh, computer systems, disciplines, and rewards. This facility really is one of those few that you get a chance to see that are totally uh, self-managed and everyone is treated as an equal at the facility. It really allows the assembly team members future opportunities to learn the process within the, or within the facility and increase their personal skill sets and expand their future career op uh, opportunities within the company. I think you saw evidence of that earlier uh, in, uh, in the video. Uh, you also heard Ted mention just a minute ago that they've seen significant growth, steady significant growth over the last several years during a time when the aviation industry has not necessarily seen that kind of growth. And they have not in their tenure since 1993 when they uh, began that operation here ever, as Ted mentioned, uh, 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 um, saw a layoff at that facility. But what I really wanted to emphasize with you guys um, tonight uh, was some other things that they do there that I don't think most people are aware of. And that specifically, uh, recently I had the opportunity to attend a meeting um, that GE held with some local officials uh, and some education uh, um, leaders in the region. Um, recently, their local, uh, Durham's local at this facility, women's leadership group within the plant, which they uh, strongly encourage uh, women's and, and diversity within their plant, they had been working with GE officials. They went to actually the leadership of GE and suggested to them that they thought that there was an opportunity for GE to get more involved in uh, uh, creating aviation-related um, opportunities within uh, the Durham public school systems and the community colleges in the region. And so GE uh, administration worked with the local leadership group to put together uh, a presentation um, with the Durham Public Schools Area Community College and quite frankly all the way up to the North Carolina Education uh, Department in which they talked about the opportunity for the creation uh, in, the, in the area of an air avionics, uh, aeronautics academies within the Durham Public School Systems. Um, they brought in some experts that have been doing this in about 10 um, high school systems across the United States and talked about the various ways that Durham Public Schools in our community could actually invest in that. And as part of that presentation, we had the opportunity to hear how they would uh, engage um, students uh, directly at the facility uh, to meet uh, Vice Chairs, Mayor Pro Temps, 
um, position here about internships and talked significantly about how the aeronautic academies across the United States that were successful were actually to engage students in those internships in their, in their, uh, in their communities. And um, we, and have, as you can see here, and we believe there's really no more exciting feed, field uh, to be engaged in as a young student. There's certainly no more op better opportunity to be involved in cutting edge technology. And as you can see also tonight, there's really not uh, many better paying fields than the aviation industry. So we're really excited to be working with them in, in that behalf. We think it's pretty obvious uh, that this expansion will yield new manufacturing assembly jobs, net tax revenue for the city, and ensure that GE avi Aviation stay here and continue to grow in Durban. We would strongly urge you to help us send that message back to GE. Thank you very much. Victoria Peterson. Mr. Mayor, when I first came to North Carolina, it was in the late 70s, and before I came, um, Probably very few people know this, but I have uh, training, I have experience in flying. I was flying the Cessna as well as the Beechcraft. I don't know if that's still on the market, but the Beechcraft is a very, very nice plane. Um, I was very disappointed because I could, not, I could not continue on with my flying to get my flying license. I had the flying license in New Jersey and in Pennsylvania. A young person could have training. Um, there is a need, and it would really be nice to have our young people to get involved uh, really with this industry. And actually, years ago, when I came to Durham, there was actually an African-American flying uh, club uh, that we would go out towards Roxboro. I, I, don't, I don't think they're still around, but if any of you know Mr. Um, Stevens, the insurance gentleman, he was one of the gentlemen uh, that was in that flying club. So we had, Durham does have some of the uh, old timers uh, who are flyers. Um, but I think it would be good to have something like this, that our young men and women, Durham Tech, North Carolina Central, even some of these kids that have, might have dropped out of school, uh, could get back into school if they could see something new. Flying is awesome. To be in that sky, it's like being with God. I mean, very close on a beautiful, clear day with the clouds and the sky. It's, it's just a beautiful feeling. And I would really love to see our young people in this community really have that opportunity to fly. You know, there's a song on that. But I do, I would like to say this though. I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. Um, I would like to see Mr. Mayor to make sure that the African American community, our young men, and I'm hoping that this company has been here for a few years, but I'm hoping that they are reaching out to young African American men and women in this community uh, to make sure that they get some skills. I'm hoping that maybe Kevin to try to see if there could be a job um, training program uh, added in the future uh, where, where some of our young folks could get trained and get certified. Because a lot of companies will hire you, they will train you, but they won't certify you. Because if you get certified, then that means you may want to stay with that company five or six years and move on and work with another company. But when that certification does not happen, they're sort of there. But uh, I say good luck to this company, and I wish I could fly. <laughs> and thank you, Mr. Mayor. You're welcome. <laughs> I, no, I didn't. Thank you. Uh, that concludes persons that are signed up to speak on a public hearing item. Anyone else? Not let the record reflect. No one else has to speak. Uh, close the public hearing. The matter is back before the council. Been properly moved and second. Recognize Councilman Moffitt. Uh, I'm just going to take a moment. Somebody asked during the um, E Town Hall meeting what council does to create jobs, and you know, we, I, I'm looking at this project. Been look, we've been looking at it for a few weeks, and you know, I look at the scale and I say, look, on the one hand, they have, um, they've got. They're an established community citizen, GE is. They're, they're a minimum $20 million investment, estimated at 29, a minimum of 50 jobs. 
permanent, full-time, estimated $60,000 per year average. Um, and they're going to work with our job link career system. And that doesn't count all the additional jobs that are created um, by creating, because the, it, it's exponential. And on top of that, they're going to pay an estimated $557,000 in extra property taxes over five years. And what's our part in it? $400,000 over five years. And why? Why would I? 25% of our children live in poverty. We need jobs. We have too many unemployed. And opportunities like this are something we should reach out for. So um, it, I appreciate the time to make that comment. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, <coughs> will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Thank you. We'll move on to item 20, comprehensive, comprehensive plan amendment 800 West Cornwallis Road. Good evening, excuse me. Good evening, Steve Medlin with the Durham City County Planning Department. Before I begin, I'd like to certify that items 20 through 24 have had proper legal notice provided and that affidavits are part of the case files for public review. Uh, uh, plan amendment case A1302, 800 West Cornwallis Road, is a request by FZH Management to change the future land use map, uh, map designation from medium density residential to commercial for a 0.174 acre tract. The site is located in the urban tier north of West Cornwallis Road, west of Hope Valley Road, and south of Durham Chapel Hill Boulevard. In reviewing the application, staff determined the request to be consistent with the criteria for plan amendments in the Unified Development Ordinance and with policies found in the conference plan. Staff is recommending approval of the change to the future land use map. The Planning Commission heard this case on April 9th of this year and by unanimous vote recommended approval. I'll be happy to answer any questions the Council may have. Uh, you've heard the staff report. It's a public hearing. I'll try the public hearing to be open, ask other questions by members of the Council on this item. Is there anyone in the public that wants to speak on this item? You have two minutes. You can state your name. Uh, we, we're getting all these former city council people speaking tonight. Uh, Kim Griffin. I'm Kim Griffin. I'm with Griffin Associates Realtors. Proud to see you here tonight, Howard. At this hour of the evening, I'm brushing my teeth and getting ready for bed. So if I fall asleep, please wake me up. Uh, I'm representing Ferris Hanna, who bought uh, 2715 Durham Chapel Hill Boulevard. We've leased it out to the Pennies for Change uh, thrift store for the Durham Crisis Response Center. Uh, when he bought the property, we had some dead trees next door. We went and talked to Mechanics and Farmers Bank, our neighbor. They said that uh, they'd like for Mr. Hanna to have the lot versus them, so he purchased it and it's uh, got um, a lot of pine trees that were diseased so they've all been taken down. We've run out of parking. The um, thrift store has done very well. The restaurants across the street have done very well. They, uh, folks come and park on his property to go to the other surrounding businesses. And so what we'd like to do is expand the parking a little bit. And I'd be glad to answer any questions you have. Anyone else that wants to speak on this item? Thank you. If not, uh, let the record reflect no one else has to speak. I'll declare the public hearing to be closed. The matter is back before the council. Move the item. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Move to item 21, zoning map change, 800 West Cornwallis Road, Z13 Good evening, Steve Medlin with the Durham Planning Department. Once again, zoning case Z1303-800 West Con Wallace Road is a request to change the zoning designation of a 0.174 acre tract located at 800 West Cornwallis Road from residential suburban 10 to commercial general. Staff has determined that the request is compliant with the future land use designation of the comprehensive plan, which designates the site as commercial. Uh, the Planning Commission uh, heard this item at their April 9th meeting and by a vote of 13 to 0 recommended approval. Again, this is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. You've heard a staff report. would ask the first questions by members of the council. If not, uh, 
I have Kim Griffin that is signed up to speak for item 21. Is anyone else who wants to speak on this item? I'm sorry, I recognize Councilwoman Katati. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to ask staff to please clarify the buffer requirements and if any additional plantings will be required. Um, there will be a opaque buffer required between the commercial general um, zoning and the adjacent residential zoning on Cornwallis. Uh, it is, um, we're looking it up, excuse me. We'll verify. The current ordinance provision would require a 20 foot buffer. In essence, yes. Is that it? Again, I have one speaker, Kim Griffin. Anyone else want to speak? I'm not recognize Kim Griffin. Choose not to speak. Let the record reflect Kim Griffin. I just say the city. same thing. All right. Well, that's good. Uh, let the record reflect that. No one else wanted to speak on this item. I'll declare the public hearing to be closed. Matter of fact, before the council. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 0. Thank you. Move to item 22 Conference Plan Amendment, Eno Economic Development District A12000012. Good evening, Steve Madlin with the Durham City County Planning Department. Uh, Eno Economic Development District Plan Amendment Case A1212 is a request to make the Durham Flum future land use map consistent with the Orange County land use plans. The Planning Department is recommending a number of changes to the Durham uh, future land use map in an area known as the Eno Economic Development District, which is located west of the city of Durham near the interchange of I-85 and US-70 in Orange County. These proposed changes come at the tail end of a process that began several years ago. In 2008, Orange County adopted a small area plan that did two things. First, it laid out a vision for the area to become a hub of economic activity with light industrial, distribution, office service, and retail uses. And second, it endorsed the idea of an interlocal agreement between Orange County and the City of Durham to extend water and sewer services to help support those economic development initiatives. The interlocal agreement regarding the water and sewer extension was approved in 2011 and the engineering process for the extension of the utilities has begun. In September of 2012, Orange County amended their future land use map for the district to economic development. The purpose of these proposed plan amendments is to be more compatible with Orange County's future land use map and the intent of the Eno Economic Development District Small Area Plan. While this planning process has been lar largely, excuse me, largely led by Orange County, Durham planning staff believe that these proposed land uses are reasonable given the investment in water sewer infrastructure and the presence of major transportation uh, corridors. Uh, these proposed changes are strictly policy changes and do not impact current zoning. Uh, the zoning in this case is still in Orange County's jurisdiction. The Planning Commission recommended approval of these amendments at their April 9th meeting on a vote of 13 to 0. I'll be happy to answer any questions the Council may have. Uh, again, this is a public hearing item. You've heard the staff report. Uh, the public hearing is open. I would ask first of all questions by members of the council. We have five persons that have signed up to speak, but let me hear comments, questions by members of the council. If not, uh, Darcy Wilson, if you can come to the podium to the right, uh, Sarah Glass, Chris Zikirby, uh, Joseph Henderson and Dr. Tom H. Arvick. Uh, each have three minutes. Hi, uh, my name is Darcy Wilson. I live at 5315 Old Hillsboro Road, which is also old NC10. And uh, the area across from me, across NC10 from me is uh, proposed that it's changed from residential to industrial. This area also adjoins other, uh, is adjacent to other residential areas. And um, so I, this proposed land use change allows large areas of industry adjacent to and surrounding existing residential communities. This will destroy the neighborhood and disrupt the homes and lives of the people who live here. Development should enhance the existing community not destroy it. It is important that development include areas for shopping, working, schools, child care, medical facilities, and jobs in a balance. 
transitional zoning should be utilized to shield existing and new residential areas as well as environmentally sensitive areas from industrial areas. The current proposal has the majority of the Eno Economic Development District classified as industrial. In the 80s when the district was created, the plan was for mixed use development that would be sensitive to the Eno River, Duke Forest, as well as existing residential areas. This proposal does not do that. I believe it would be in the public interest for the city of Durham to consider changes that address these issues before allowing this proposal to move forward. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Sarah Glass. Thank you. My name is Dr. Sarah Glass. I live in Weldon Ridge Court, which is just south of the area in the Eno Economic Development um, District. Two FYIs I'd like to start with. One is that our neighborhood was actually not notified of the meeting that um, Mr. Medlin has spoke about where this was actually approved. Although we were on the list, the affidavit which Hannah Jacobs had provided, none of us in our neighborhood for some reason received this, and so we were unable to actually influence the planning board in, the, in this decision-making um, decision process. Also, importantly, as Mr. Medlin highlighted, this is consistent with Orange County. Um, what Orange County has not passed along is that the property owners who are affected by this plan have actually not had their concerns sufficiently addressed. So I'd like to highlight four concerns that I personally have as a new mom, a scientist, and a community member in Durham in the city that I love and choose to raise my family in. The first concern that we have really is around environmental water concerns. In the plan, the Region 2, which we don't have in front of us, um, is changed from very low density residential to industrial. This area includes the Stony Creek Wildlife Corridor, which connects Eno, Eno River State Park to the Duke Forest. So zoning changes in 2008, which were mentioned, led to an industry called Gorilla Industries moving in, which resulted in stormwater rainoff that come from mountains of materials that are of unknown origin. And these all go into Stony Creek, which then contributes to the um, new water supply or Falls Lake. So my question is, does the planning board have, a, some, have scientific data that has actually evaluated the effect of this, this um, stormwater rainoff into the Stony Creek? And you know, if Gorilla or a similar industry went into these proposed areas, does the planning board actually have data to say that this is not going to have a negative impact on our environment? Secondly, as a mom and someone raising my family, I have significant concerns about the air quality. Obviously, increased industry really has impact on increased heavy equipment for transporting materials, which, during which a line of pollutants is generated from the point of origin to the destination. Old NC-10 is a primary route affected here. Studies actually suggest that mortality and disease rates, including cancer and severe respiratory rates, are higher in residents who are affected and close to industry um, areas. And so this is actually worsened if the products are transported through the residential areas as are along NC-10, which is 100 feet from my back door that I open up every day to let this beautiful North Carolina weather in. Third is safety. And I would encourage a lot of you to just drive through this area. It's a beautiful rural road. It's two lane. However, it's a curvy road that's bookended by two um, railroad tracks that are low bridges. There have already been two individuals who have died at the intersection of Old NC-10 and Mount Harmon Church. I, I would like to ask the planners, has this been sufficiently addressed? What is the impact of all this new equipment driving on this old NC-10 going to have? What is it really going to take? Is it going to take another death before you know, the officials and the um, city actually consider our concerns? That's it. Thank you. You're welcome. Again, if you have written remarks, if you have written remarks, you can leave them with the clerk. Uh, Chris. Kelsey? Kelsey, yes, thank you. So I have two primary concerns regarding the Durham Comprehensive Plan Amendment. Uh, first, in my opinion, there's been insufficient public involvement and opportunities for public input in regards to the Durham Plan. Uh, second, there's been a lack of communication and or planning in regards to this area. So for example, the public really became aware of this about two years ago when a neighborhood meeting was held right in our neighborhood uh, that Orange County kind of chaired. There was some involvement by the Durham Planning Board. Uh, th there was another neighborhood meeting. There was two meetings by the county commissioners in Orange County. And overall, the public 
uh, response to this was decidedly negative for, for many reasons. And because of uh, public input, Orange County decided not to change the zoning from rural residential to uh, heavy industrial and light industrial along old NC-10 and the surrounding area. There's really been minimal uh, involvement by the Dur Durham Planning uh, Board in regards to this. And these are really, really big changes. This is changing a rural residential neighborhood into a big industrial footprint. And so in my opinion, I think there needs to be more input from Durham, the Durham Planning Board communicating with the neighbors and getting input. Uh, for example, I, I personally would recommend a neighborhood meeting where the Durham Planning Board came and spoke to the neighborhood and, uh, and discussed their plans. Uh, for example, at the very first neighborhood meeting, there was many, many people that showed up, uh, which I think uh, gives the planning board a, an idea of what the public feels about uh, these proposed changes. Second, there's also been a lack of planning and communication in regards to three things, environmental, safety, and land valuation. So as Sarah commented on, uh, one of the areas that's uh, earmarked for industrial involves the Stony Creek Wildlife Corridor, which was set apart in August, on August 5th, 1996, to connect the, Stony, uh, connect the Eno River State Park and the Duke Forest. And this industrial area, which is currently rural residential, becomes industry. And there's been no comment from the Durham Planning on Board on how they're going to protect this area and this wildlife corridor. Secondary, or second, uh, there's no uh, talk about safety. There's no access to I-85 I South from Mount Hermon Church Road. So these big industrial trucks go up to old NC-10, the road that I live on, uh, which is a two-lane rural residential road with multiple low-clearance railroad trestles uh, with very tight blind S-curves. This road is not equipped to handle the heavy traffic that industry would provide. Uh, and, and third, there's been no discussion about how a big industrial footprint is going to affect the rural residential neighbors who are there first. So I would recommend more public input and more neighborhood meetings. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Joseph Henderson. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor, City Council members. I'm here to uh, speak for Ms. Lucinda Harper, who is the owner of the acreage at 5316 Old Hillsborough Road. Uh, she couldn't make it here this evening, but said she welcomes her uh, presence from the city of Durham and Old Hillsborough Road is probably one of the most bucolic and beautiful entrances into our city and I think that as you move ahead on this you really shouldn't think about how you're going to do it because only one time it's, it's one of the times when you really get a chance to sit back on the drive and say I am coming into the city of Durham and, and I think this is a very special thing. And some of the things I think uh, from Mrs. Harper's standpoint that you need to consider uh, on doing this is to take a stance now in your uh, proposal to uh, allow multi-tier uh, apartment buildings along that acreage. Uh, also, maintain a two unit per acre uh, limit on, on that on those properties going down old 10. I think that that's fair uh, within and just in keeping with the general beauty that, uh, that surrounds there. Also on 70, say no right now to any drive through restaurants. I mean, that is one of the things that we have enough of as we move further down Hillsborough Road and we certainly don't need any more as you go on 70. And also I want you to really think very uh, to move slowly in any kind of economic development along that property. As we move forward, you can at any time legislate big box development. Any time you can do that. But you only get one time to legislate beauty. So let's take our time on this project and ease into it and really preserve that driving view into our city that we have going on Old Ten. We've all enjoyed for many, many years to come. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Dr. John H. Harvick. Mr. Mayor, ladies and gentlemen of the City Council, thank you for your attention. 
By being present tonight, I have demonstrated my respect for your expertise and for your service to the city. That is, I have been retired over six years and I love it, but I don't shave and wear a necktie and stay up this late for just any old body. Last week, I sent each of you a brief email detailing my concern about the proposed comprehensive plan changes with Orange County. In it, I presented data and information about the risks of placing commercial and industrial operations in close proximity to residential areas. I reiterate here my deep concerns about the probability, not possibility, probability of higher rates of cancers, respiratory and cardiac diseases, as was mentioned by Dr. Glass, and the loss of quality of life near Highway 70 and old NC-10 should such operations be approved. I understand that Durham did not request this alliance with Orange County, has no mandate to perform, but should not accept the liability for the increased risk that is inevitable should this area be rezoned from rural residential to industrial activities. The area included in the Eno Development District has been zoned for residential use for many years and it contains a significant environmentally protected area. The area <coughs> is served by old NC-10 and is an area of beauty and of historical significance. It has already been violated by at least one serious pollution source of airborne particulate matter. And if you recall the video you saw earlier in the evening of the truck going down the road and the dust coming out, just think of that as the entry way to this one business that has been allowed in there. Please let's not encourage another. I ask your positive consideration of my written concerns and that you grant my professional concern that the respect that over 50 years of experience in scientific research, health safety, business management, and economic development should deserve. Thank you for your attention. You're welcome. Is there anyone else that wants to speak on this uh, item that hasn't signed up to speak? Uh, if not, let the record reflect that no one else asked to speak on this item. Uh, before I close the public hearing, I guess uh, I <coughs> want to make sure I understood, Steve, uh, the question about notification on this item. Um, I'm speaking to the point that the gentleman raised about not having been notified. notified. Yeah. Uh, we did, I was made aware that there was a concern that notification was not carried out in accordance with general statute and UDO. Uh, by law, we are only required to put the letters into first class mail. Uh, and we were able to verify that those letters were mailed on time. Uh, and we have affidavits to that effect that they were mailed. Uh, unfortunately, once it gets into the U.S. Postal System, we have no control over whether they actually get returned. I did verify with Ms. Jacobson, the case planner on this, that we did not receive any mail back from the Postal Service, so we're not sure exactly what happened, but we have fulfilled our legal requirements. Yes, who, whoever raised the, the question, the point. Dr. Arvick, I think one of the, uh, the problems that we have here and that we have all had as residents of this new developed area some years ago is there are two Weldon Ridges in Durham. Uh, the letters did not go to our Weldon Ridge. It went to the other Weldon Ridge, which is some considerable distance away and is not affected by this change. I, I, let, let me understand. Weldon Ridge, I, th I thought they were mailed we, to We did verify houses. that the addresses were correct for these, these citizens, so. Okay. So the documents that were provided on the website and that we received by email from uh, Ms. Jacobson suggest that that's not the case. Is you look at Weldon Ridge and it, it has a different, it's like Tyler Court or something like that and not Weldon Ridge Court which is our home. Um, let me ask again before I close the public hearing, are there any comments, questions by members of the council on this item? Recognize Councilwoman Katati. Thank you, Mayor. I have a few questions and I do appreciate folks coming and staying this late. 
Um, could planning staff please clarify exactly what the jurisdiction is between Orange County and Durham City, and then also the water and sewer status, and then I have another question. Sure, Aaron Kane with the Planning Department. Um, this is an area of Orange County that is still under Orange County jurisdiction. So all Orange County zoning currently applies and will still apply no matter what action you take tonight. But it's a portion of Orange County that is included on the future land use map of the Durham Comprehensive Plan because there have been talks for many years between Orange County and the City of Durham about extending water and sewer services to this portion of Orange County as an economic development node for Orange County. So we participated with Orange County from 2006 to 2008 on putting together a small area plan for the area and the action that we're asking you to take tonight would make our future land use map congruent with what Orange County adopted in their small area plan in 2008 and the changes they made to their future land use map in 2012. Thank you. Um, my next question is about Orange County zoning. I mean, I know what Durham's UDO says, but I don't know Orange County's rules. What is the zone, the buffer, the, oh, the zoning buffer from industrial to residential? Do in they Orange. have a transitional use area like we do? I, I don't know that they do, and I could not speak at all with any certainty on Orange County zoning ordinances okay. or zoning or zoning regulations. I don't know if Steve behind you was planning on saying something. No? Okay. So then another question. If you look at the map, the land use map, the bulk of it was in purple before, so industrial. There's one small parcel. I don't mean small by any stretch, but I mean on our map. Um, area number seven that has go gone from, I believe, very low uh, residential. I'm mm -hmm. not looking at the map, but I'm looking at my You're looking at, at area colleagues. number two, I believe. It's going from very low density to industrial. No, I'm looking at number seven. It's it's number seven. So okay, low yeah, yeah. density to industrial, which mm -hmm. seems like the most extreme transition for that one parcel. And then the other areas, five, um, I guess mm -hmm. five, went from, thank you, Steve, low density residential to uh, office. To office. Okay. But, but seven seems the most concerning to me, and I'm not familiar with that. It's sort of internal to the parcel. Can you comment on that? Sure. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, only that we've got to remember that industrial does not necessarily mean heavy industrial. In Durham parlance, industrial could mean anything from heavy industrial, resource extraction, that sort of thing, smokestack, typical smokestack industries, to warehousing and distribution, um, to self-storage, to those types of uses. You, industrial means a very wide range of uses in Durham. Um, so we don't expect that this area would all eventually become um, some sort of heavy industrial. We don't expect that at all. What we do expect is that there would be eventually should water and sewer be provided to the area, some, some land agglomeration, some land um, aggregation in the area so that higher intensity uses could be used, take advantage of the water sewer and take advantage of US 70 and the interchange with I-85, which is expected to uh, be improved over the next, I believe it's eight to 10 years. So we're taking a very long range view of this. We don't expect any of these changes to occur in the near future, probably sometime after the interchange um, improvements in the next eight to 10 years. And just lastly, if it was, if water and sewer was ex were to be extended, it would come with a voluntary annexation petition, even in Orange County. Is Correct. That true? They would, in order by policy, in order, and it's under, it's acknowledged in the small area plan that Orange County adopted in 2008. Um, in order to be able to get access to the City of Durham water and sewer services, it would be through a voluntary um, annexation, as if there was anybody in Durham County looking to tap on and become a member of the Durham City. And just for the record, what is Durham's UDO policy and transitional area from, sorry, buffer, You're now I'm running out of steam, time. from um, industrial to residential. Is it 150 foot it would, transitional? It would be a 0 .8, which is an 80 foot, or 60 foot buffer, excuse me. 60 mm -hmm. foot, thank you. Okay. Had you concluded your comments, questions? Are there other questions or comments on, on this item? I, um, I have to admit I'm a bit befuddled about this because I, I know we had spent a considerable amount of time uh, 
talking about extending water and sewer into this area uh, because of Orange County's desire to uh, change the economic development area over in that, in that particular part of the county. Uh, but I didn't realize the impact that we were talking about having on persons on, on our side of the, uh, the line over in Durham. So I, I don't know what can be done to address the questions that the persons have raised. Uh, I know what could be done, we just wouldn't approve it. But uh, I'm not so sure I'm at, at that point. Uh, do you have any suggestions from the staff on this item? Well, I think one, one thing that was brought up was environmental concerns, especially along Stony Creek, and to remind everyone that we do have r rules in Durham, should it be annexed and developed under Durham standards, we do have minimum 50 foot buffers. If it is in a protected watershed, it would be a minimum 100 foot buffer on either side of the stream. So there would be some stream protections in those areas, and they would not be able to build right over the streams. We do have stormwater regulations that require stormwater treatment. Um, before anything is discharged. So we do have some pretty strict, and for North Carolina, we have some quite strict environmental standards that would need to be upheld um, as part of any future development in that area. Uh, yes, since you've raised a lot of questions, sure. Thank you, I'm sorry. I just wanted to comment that Orange County also has those you know, strict regulations. And the reality is, and we've actually sent letters, numerous, many letters, photos, everything. The reality is, even if these setbacks are in place, 50 feet, 60 feet, 100 feet, 150 feet, is it, does it really make a difference if you have a, a mound of 50 feet of dirt that's just sort of piling? If there's 50 feet and there's storms like we had today, it's going to go into the stream. That the reality is it's going to go there. If I live a half a mile away, am I going to see a smokestack? Absolutely, absolutely. So I think with all due respect to the setbacks and everything, I think it just also needs to be acknowledged that, that setbacks when it comes to industry next to residential don't really actually do, do what they're designed to do. Thank you. All right, I, I, we need to, to take some action on this. Uh, I haven't closed the public hearing. I'm about to close the public hearing uh, or continue it. So uh, let me, any other comments on this? Recognize Councilman Shul. I just wonder if some of, uh, you know, I'm, I guess I'm surprised to hear these comments. And I'm not sure, um, you know, maybe that's because it's an Orange County matter and that haven't heard from people. I did get your one, the one email. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit, I think you were, used the word befuddled, Mr. Mayor. I, I'm having a little bit of the same feeling about it. Um, and uh, would just appreciate some more guidance either from my colleagues or from the planning staff about, uh, you know, kind of, you know, what people are thinking about proceeding from here. It, it, I am a little bit discomfited about the, uh, the, the, uh, the notification. I, I, I understand from Stephen, totally believe that, that you sent them. It also does seem to me that they didn't get it. Um, and. And I don't understand what process Orange County went through that these folks could participate in because we're not in Orange County. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of an unusual situation. Usually I think we can really count on our process because it's our process. Mm -hmm. And I know that I have a tremendous amount of trust in it. Here, I don't know exactly what these people have, had, have gone through. So is there any other guidance that, that uh, you could give? <clears throat> Certainly I appreciate the comments that were received this evening from the public. Um, I think certainly an option before council is just to refer this matter back to planning staff, allow us time to work with the community. Uh, it sounds like there's a little bit of education that needs to occur, you know, specifically about what is actually on the table, and also allow us time to try to address some of the concerns that have been uh, raised this evening. I've heard a motion of second. Is the discussion on the motion questions raised? Councilman yeah. Moffitt. I, I just wanted to raise one quick question. City Manager had a comment. Uh, kind of going back to the Councilmember Schul's uh, comment, Mr. Medlin, about the, the process. Mm -hmm. so, so could you clarify for the record, I mean, what communication or, uh, you know, relationship our planning staff has with sure. the Orange County planning staff? I don't know if anybody is here from Orange County this uh, evening on their professional staff that might, you know, might comment. Obviously, when sure. we have these things come before us, 
because we have a joint city county department, you know, there, you know, the folks are one and the same, but it seems like there may be an opportunity for this body even at some point to hear from the, the Orange County uh, planning staff in conjunction with your consideration rather than us try to interpret or, you know, communicate on their behalf since, you know, it, it is a little bit different than, than we're used to. Sure. I would like to ask Aaron to respond to that first question there involving the engagement side of the, uh, the, the, the process here. Uh, he and his staff were the ones that were most directly involved. Yeah, too. Um, so I was the original staff person on the small area plan representing Durham on the small area plan in Orange County. Um, I participated as well as Ted Voorhees from the city manager's office from 2006 to 2008. We had at least six meetings of a steering committee that was also open to the public and or advertised by Orange County to the public in the area and many came. The primary concerns at that point were bringing out the water and sewer services and what would be the rules and regulations that would need to be followed for extension of water and sewer. But the idea uh, at that time, the idea of non-residential development, of greater intensity of development uh, for economic development in that area was um, pretty much understood and accepted by those who participated in that process. Once the small area plan was adopted in 2008, uh, Orange County began its process to put together the interlocal agreement that you all approved in 2011. And then once that interlocal agreement was approved, they moved forward with doing the land use changes and we decided to let Orange County do their land use changes first, first for the future land use map and then for the zoning. And then once Orange County approved theirs in the fall of 2012, we began our process on the Durham side. Um, we did hold the uh, one neighborhood meeting as required by the UDO in the, I believe it was the winter of 2012 um, at the Murphy School over in Orange County and continued to feed field questions and, and answer questions as they came to us. Um, but this was something primarily driven by Orange County, uh, but we did have staff participation both at the planning staff level and at the city manager's level as well, going back to 2006. We, we are still discussing it, Councilman Clement. I was going to recognize Councilman Moffitt, Councilman Katati, but I defer to the city manager to get his question in. That's fine. Recognize Councilman Moffitt. Thank you. I'm going to pass. I guess Councilman my question Katani. is do we need a date certain or we just send it back and that's it? You'll bring it back when? Um, at this juncture, I would just simply refer it back to the staff. We'll re advertise and re notice, obviously, when it does come back. Partly because we're not, I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure how quickly we would get something back to you at this point. Uh, well, in that case, I'll close the public hearing if you go re advertise it. That's correct. Uh, I have a motion on the floor to uh, refer it back, but I. We're going to close the public hearing now and entertain the motion. The motion has been made. Uh, any further questions on the motion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Thank you. <laughs> so that deals with 22. And your comments on 23? Uh, good evening. Steve Matlin with the Durham City County Planning Department. The evaluation and assessment report, the EAR, serves as an opportunity to look back over the previous uh, calendar year to evaluate progress towards implementation of the comprehensive plan, uh, to propose changes to policy language, and to rectify any differences between the city and county future land use map. This year, there are two new sections uh, that we've added. The first is a technical update to the open space and agriculture layers of the future land use map. And the second is a report prepared by graduate students at UNC Chapel Hill on the topic of forecasting land use and planning trends. Uh, staff would like to publicly recognize and thank the two students who volunteered to put together the report, Holly Safi and Daniel Band. Uh, I think you've seen the report and I think it's outstanding and staff really does appreciate it. But I think we're gonna, uh, we're gonna see that it's gonna serve as the uh, foundation for a lot of our work that we're gonna be doing in the next year. The staff's recommendation is that the council approve the evaluation assessment report specifically by rectifying the future land use map by accepting the one plan amendment approved by the Board of County Commissioners, which was the Alexander Park development, case A1108, uh, adopting changes to policy language proposed by individual departments and agencies, and amending the recreation open space layer and agricultural layer of the future land use map to reflect updated information received about land held and permanent conservation easements. Planning Commission recommend approval of the evaluation and assessment report by a vote of 13 to 0 on April 9th of this year. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. 
Uh, this is a public hearing matter. I will declare the public hearing to be open. You've heard the staff report. I would ask other questions by members of the council on the staff report. Questions or comments? Recognize Councilman Moffitt. I just want to uh, agree with um, Mr. Medlin's assessment of the report. It's uh, extremely high quality and at the appropriate time I'll be happy to move that we um, approve it. Any other comments by members of the staff? I mean, council. Is there anyone in the public that wants to comment on this item, either for or against? Uh, let the record reflect that no one else wanted to comment on this on the public hearing. I'll declare the public hearing to be closed. Matter of fact, before council. Move approval. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, we open the vote. Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. We move to item 24, consolidated annexation item. 751 South, I recognize the planning director. Good evening, Steve Medlin with the Durham Planning Department. This is a consolidated annexation item which includes a utility extension agreement and voluntary annexation petition for the 751 South development and the adjacent 751 investment assemblage. The sites are located on the west side of 751 South of Stagecoach Road. The extension agreement would allow extension of city water and sewer to the project. The proposed effective date of the annexation is June 3rd of two, uh, 2023. Uh, you've heard the uh, staff report. This is a public hearing matter. Uh, recognize the city attorney. Mr. Mayor, members of council, uh, there have been revisions uh, to documents based on some um, uh, occurrences that have um, taken place since you took action on May the 9th to adopt a resolution requesting special legislation to amend section uh, 2.3 of the city charter that would allow you to delay uh, the effective date of any annexation for up to 10 years. Um, at the time that the documents were prepared, there was an anticipation that we would have that legislation in place. Um, by uh, this time, uh, we do not have that legislation in, pa in place at this time. In fact, there is a hearing scheduled for 8.30 tomorrow morning in the Finance Committee. It's been made uh, clear to me uh, that the General Assembly wanted uh, the city to act first on the annexation and uh, utility extension agreement request before they would um, uh, put in front of the, uh, the body the, um, uh, the city charter uh, request that you've um, uh, uh, made back in, in uh, May of, um, of this year. So um, we have uh, changed some of the language and the tweaks that I had uh, mentioned uh, to some of you earlier today essentially make this this entire uh, process the, the items that are in front of you uh, c contingent upon the General Assembly actually passing uh, that uh, that request for the Charter Amendment um, to allow us to delay our annexations for up to 10 years. If they do not take that action in this uh, um, uh, session, then uh, anything that you do tonight will, will fail and be uh, null and void uh, because it is now contingent upon uh, that legislation piece. Uh, we've also made adjustments to the meets and bounds attachment, uh, essentially the, the piece, and I, I, for want of a better term, call it the Culvert Farms piece, uh, uh, the meets and bounds were, were put in four separate tracks, um, but we really needed one uh, single track with the perimeter on that, and those changes have been made um, and have been uploaded to your to your agenda. And if you have any questions about the, that item, uh, just let me know. Are there questions on the city attorney's comments relative to this item? Uh, that being the case, are there any other comments on the Council, before I go to the persons that want to speak, sign up to speak. Uh, okay, we'll move with uh, persons that signed up to speak on this item. Uh, I have one, two, three, four, five, six persons that have signed up to speak. Uh, I'm going to call the names. Uh, let's try four minutes each. Uh, Helen Fisher, Steve Bocchino, Victoria Peterson. Susan Seal, Sewell, Donna Rudolph, Carolyn Aronson. Now, is there anyone else that wants to speak whose name I didn't call? Uh, Tom Miller, anyone else? Okay, uh, Helen Fisher. Hi, yes, uh, thank you. Um, all great cities 
protect their watersheds. New York City and Boston city leaders recognized the necessity to have clean water and protected theirs. Certainly, private companies have their place, but is an LED company which claims to be energy and environmentally conscious really so if it's willing to foul all our water for the profit of a few? Privatized gain and socialized risk. This company's influence did not allow an impartial survey by county commissioners to clearly and fairly draw the critical watershed lines. They sanctioned the private survey approved by the former planning director done during a severe drought when the water level was so low that the 167 acres in question fell outside the line. A second survey not done during a severe drought showed 751 South to be inside the critical watershed. Over and over, the agenda item for digital billboards kept returning. What goes into digital billboards? Isn't it LED lights? A former county commissioner said the agenda item had been turned down so many times, it had literally been beaten to death. I guess no never really means no if they don't respect you. It keeps resurfacing. Um, large digital billboards filled with LEDs, not on our roadsides, but over our highways. Don't these lights factor into the private company's profits? And in the last two months, we've heard from the DOT what a great idea it is to have stoplights at the end of every highway ramp. How have we ever managed to ride on highways and interstates since the 1950s without having stoplights filled with LEDs at every entrance ramp? A private company subsidized by taxpayers. And now, we as consumers, we've been offered the opportunity to purchase LED light bulbs for the incredibly low price $39 per light bulb for one light bulb. Again, private gain for the company. I ask you, is this the vampire squid on the face of Durham? I recommend voting against extending utilities to 751 South and against annexation. If the state legislature passes a law mandating cities to extend utilities, don't give them political cover. Let them stand and fall by their decision. If we in Durham have more needs than revenues, don't give $10 million of our taxpayer money to a company which already exerts undue influence and is profiting at our expense. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Steve Bocchino. Steve Bocchino, 7340 Avon Drive in Durham. Uh, Mr. Mayor, City Council, good to see you, Mr. Clement. Um, we all know why we're here tonight. It's extortion, pure and simple. And who are the extortionists? The very same people in the General Assembly behind voter suppression, behind women's oppression, behind racial regression. The reason a thousand people assembled in Raleigh tonight and 88 of them from Durham. Now they're holding a gun to your head. They say, pass this, pass this annexation or else. The, extortions are, the extortionists are led by one Tim Moore, Republican from Kings Mountain, out in Cleveland County, 120 miles away from here. Uh, he's from Kings Mountain, but now he thinks he's the king of Durham. If you vote for this development, you're giving the extortionists exactly what they want. Uh, in my experience, that's not the way to discourage them. It would be truly a hollow gesture to pass a resolution, a resolution supporting Moral Monday after voting to support these extortionists. You'll be able to hear their laughter all the way from Raleigh, maybe even from Kings Mountain. They'll be saying, how mighty Durham has fallen. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Victoria Peterson. Uh, 
Uh, Mr. Mayor, many of us in this community, and a lot of them are not here tonight, we support. I supported the 751 project from day one. I continue to support it. We have funded numerous projects, even when the voters voted against the ballpark. When persons in this community voted against all this building going on downtown, by the second richest man in this state, a few weeks ago, this council approved for that project downtown again to get additional dollars. Tax dollars have been used for years to take care of the Durham Bulls, uh, the Durham Bulls Stadium, plus the other projects that's going down there, downtown Durham. Now, my understanding, unless something has changed here about the 751 one project, that those individuals are going to pay for this out of their own pocket. From day one, they have stated that. My understanding, that Durham residents will get jobs. I'm hoping that when they build some buildings down there for jobs, for, um, for companies to move in, for small shops, that that will also be possible. Not trying to embarrass anybody in this room, but somebody write a letter to Mr. Goodman and ask him how many African American um, businesses are down in the American Tobacco uh, Project down there. Of all the tax dollars that have gone downtown on that, on that project, where many of us pay taxes in this community, as well as African Americans, tell me how many black businesses is downtown on that project, that, that is there, that they have an office on that project. How many African Americans do you see even working down on that project? Now, the 751 individuals have made a commitment to this community to make sure that people in this community will be employed. I don't know what the problem, I don't know if it's political, Mr. Mayor, I don't know what the problem is. Fix this problem, approve this, and let's get this, pro uh, this project going and moving. And I'll tell you something else. I've heard, this, um, I've heard the city manager say, and in that report, and I'll show you, if I'm wrong, it should not be in there that this city is losing resident, um, I'm sorry, that this city is losing dollars. The tax dollars, we're losing $4.2 million. Is that right? Are we, are we losing monies or are we not losing monies? Last time when you worked on the budget, still again, we were losing do tax dollars. If this project is going to generate tax dollars to this community, why are we jerking these people around and trying to hinder their project? And the amount of monies that they're spending going to court and going here and going there, they could be putting that monies into this community. Have we lost our minds? Stop jerking these people around. It's ridiculous. You're supposed to be professional people on the move, having a good understanding of this government and what this community needs. And this community is losing tax dollars, and thank we you, need Mason. this project. And thank, thank you. you very much, Mr. Mayor. You're quite welcome. Uh, Susan Sewell. Sewell. Thank you. It's Susan Sewell. I live on Legion Avenue in Durham. Um, I'm here to oppose the current proposed agreement with 751 South. Um, back in 2010, I presented a letter on behalf of Tuscaloosa Lakewood Neighborhood Association um, to the county commissioners during a zoning hearing. I want to take a moment to highlight some of the reasons we opposed this development at that time. It would drastically alter our county's development direction. They have manipulated the UDOs to sidestep important planning considerations. 
by using required stream buffer areas to double as green space and buffer requirements, this plan includes much less open space than other plans its size. Good planning requires all interested parties participating in an open process, which has not been the case for this plan. Perhaps most disturbing to us is that the development plan has few committed elements. This is not typical of large development plans or of good planning practice. The developer's refusal of reasonable and typical committed elements and processes indicate that they are not willing to work with citizens and planners to ensure that what they build contributes positively to our region. These are decisions the developers made and this city has been very um, supportive of understanding those issues up to this now and I thank you for that up to this time. These issues are still evident in this development plan. They will cost this city if we annex. I urge you to postpone this agreement so that you can include the surrounding neighbors and other stakeholders to at least mitigate the worst of this development. I hope that we can add additional commitments that can mitigate some of the issues and help pay for the consequences of others, such as transportation that we've been trying to deal with in the budget. Thank you. Thank you, Sewell. Susan. Donna Rudolph. My name is Donna Rudolph and I live on 750, uh, off of 751. It's my way to get home tonight and out every morning. And contrary to what one speaker said, is it Victoria? Yes, they are not paying for everything. The costs that will be inherent in, in putting the traffic, 1,300 housing units and 600,000 square feet of commercial and office space will generate a great deal of traffic. And what, um, so the road 751 will have to be completely redone because I see the traffic now that goes on there and I cannot imagine the heavy construction traffic for this project, let alone the 2.2 occupants times 1,300 houses that will have car trips coming in and out. And for example, the developers will set aside a, a, a spot for a school with as many uh, inhabitants as they're going to have, they may need an elementary and a middle school. And who takes the brunt of it while they're getting enough, the bond issue to pass so that all Durham pays for the schools? Creekside and Parkwood will be overwhelmed. But in addition to the traffic and the police and the fire services, all of these cost money. What happens is all of those that the developers don't pay for, which are most of them, are going to be on the backs of all of the existing Durham residents. So what is the best plan for Durham? Growth south to build a whole new town on the borders of Jordan Lake or to develop other pockets of Durham I I within the comprehensive plan that were designated before as important development areas. But I w and I want to ask a very, very essential question. Where is the extra water coming from? The American Water Works Association says that the average householder inside the house, that's not the lawn, that's not washing the car, the house inside your washer, you're s brushing your teeth, taking a shower, 69.3 gallons a day. If you take that times the number of people who are gonna live in the 1,300 houses based on the census, I get 288,833 gallons of water a day will be needed by those 1,300 houses. And when we have a minor drought, where do we get more water for Durham? The people who have 500,000 people depend on Jordan Lake for their water supply. Not only is it going to be stretched for these people who are wanting, th for this development that will take nearly 300,000 gallons a day, but I it's going to be polluted. Jordan Lake can say goodbye to any control on pollution. I pointed out 81 acres of this 666 acres will be paved over. In fact, if you picture it, if anybody's owned an 80 acre of land, if you're not in agriculture, I grew up on a farm and that's a lot of land to pave. But look at it, it's 61 football fields paved. And that's how much runoff will go because the impermeable surface in this development is so great. 
and it is in the water boundary runoff of Jordan Lake where I'm telling you again that 500,000 people depend on for the water supply. So I think it's a devastating abuse of environmental laws and it also puts a great deal on the back of existing Durham, de Durham residents who if you put it to a vote would rather see other parts of Durham more rationally developed. Thank you. Carolyn Aronson. Hi, <coughs> excuse me. Hi, I know it's late, but um, this is really something so important. I want everyone just to take a big breath and just forget about the history of this development and just think about today, right now. And think about what you're facing. One of the groups that I'm involved with that to me has taught me so much is I'm a Rotarian. And one of the things that we always say every meeting is, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendship? And fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Those to me are the words to live by. Those words sum up the way we need our politicians to be. We need you to face the truth. Have the people that have been involved, the developers, been honest and truthful? We can look at the history. I don't have to remind you of all those details. We've all been living it for four years. And I personally have been paying for it because I pay the attorney fees, because I believe in the rights of citizens to have a protest petition. I mean, I'm just a naive Democrat, I can't help it, but I really believe in the truth passionately. And I really admired you more than you can ever imagine last year when you unanimously voted against annexation. And you voted that way because you were voting for the truth. Even if this is, forget good or bad development, personally I think it's a bad one, but look at the way they're going about this. Is this the way we want the politics of Durham to be in the future? We are at a fork in the road. We've all had those forks in our lives, whether to go for the truth or whether to lie, whether to stand up for ourselves and be strong, even when people are trying to knock us down or whether to just give in to the easy way to adapt, to make excuses. We've all had those chances. We all have. And this is a chance for each and every one of you to stand strong for the truth. It's a test. It's not just about 751 anymore. It's about each of one of you looking in the mirror tomorrow and saying, was I honest? Was I honest? Did I vote for the citizens of Durham? Did I keep integrity? I found a thing of yours, Eugene Brown, that was dear to my heart when you were writing in The Independent about what your mission statement was for the city of Durham. And I thought, my God, I love this man. He sounds like my mission statement. It was about integrity, which is dear to me. And when I think of their approach and the developers threatening Durham, with the state law and going to those measures, whether it's a good or bad development, it wouldn't matter to me. It's the principle. And to me, sometimes, I don't know, I feel like Ms. Aronson goes to Washington or Mr. Smith goes to Washington. I saw that movie too many times and I loved it. And I would stand here all night long and filibuster till I fainted if that would make a difference. But I only have 23 seconds to tell you, be honest with the citizens of Durham. Don't sell us down the river to the developers. Don't be manipulated by them. Be honest so tomorrow when you wake up and you look in the mirror, the vote that you made was a vote from your heart, a vote for the truth. Thank you. <laughs> Miller. Mr. Mayor and members of the council, my name is Tom Miller and I live on Virginia Avenue. 
And for all the reasons that the previous uh, speakers have laid out before you, I urge you to vote against this tonight. But I'm not going to raise a policy issue. Whether you intend to uh, adopt this annexation agreement or not, you can't do it tonight. And for the simple reason is you don't have the authority. It's a well-settled principle of North Carolina law that a city or a local government only has the authority that's been expressly given to it by the General Assembly or those with impl limited implied powers that must necessarily flow from an express grant of authority. Well, if the General Assembly hasn't given the city of Durham the authority to uh, do an annexation 10 years in the future, you can't do it. You cannot do it conditioned upon it becoming law later. And then we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. There will be a public hearing in the Finance Committee. That ain't enough. Uh, you just can't do it. You cannot do something the law does not permit you to do if you don't have authority. You cannot do that which is illegal today, conditioned upon it becoming illegal at some point in the future. Now, if the city of Durham gets the authority to do this annexation because the charter is amended, well, then fine. At that point, hold the public hearing, consider the agreement, and annex this place if that's what you want to do. But you cannot do it tonight. It is not legal. Thank you. Let, let me ask, are there other persons that want to speak on, on this item? Again, this is a public hearing. I, I'm going to reserve uh, closing the public hearing until I've had an opportunity to hear from members of the council. Uh, so having said that, I recognize persons who want to speak, recognize Councilwoman Katati, Councilman Moffitt, in that order. Thanks. Um, let me start by noting for everyone that the original request was for 167 acres. This request actually includes an additional 86 acres, which is the Colvard Farms. The request now includes 253 total acres. We did not do a cost-benefit analysis on the entire parcel. When, we, when this council, or most of this council, unanimously rejected it a year ago, the cost-benefit analysis was upside down for many, many years. I asked the questions that Mr. Miller raised um, to the city attorney right before, again, one last time, do we have the authority to pass this? or to use the date of June 3rd, 2023. And so I'll stop now and ask the attorney to address that. And then I'd like to continue my remarks. Thank you, Councilwoman Katati. Um, where we are with the, uh, the legislature uh, is that I made the request of, of both the developer and um, Representative Moore uh, for the same reasons that have been addressed, which is that we need the authority to do this now. Um, I was told under no uncertain circumstances that that authority would not come now. It would come after the city has uh, adopted the annexation agreement. So my hands, quite frankly, are tied. What, we, what I have done uh, through the research in terms of who would have standing to, to block the annexation, um, uh, the, the primary standing holder would be the property owner. Uh, and we have uh, required the property owner to agree in this document um, to, to not challenge the validity of the, um, of the passage of the, the ordinance um, uh, tonight and to make this entire document contingent upon getting that authority in this General Assembly um, session. So that's essentially where we are right now uh, when we are negotiating with, with folks. Um, you know, I, my, my preference clearly would have been to have the authority today. We are not going to get the authority until you move forward. So this is the best that we've been able to, uh, to, to put forth. Um, I believe that uh, certainly the, the property owner has, has, is, is bound not to challenge the, um, uh, the, the annexation ordinance should you pass it tonight. Um, and uh, we'll have to see where we are tomorrow. Uh, but this is the best that I can do in, in terms of uh, where we are tonight given the constraints that have been put on or at least uh, delivered to me by the General Assembly. I appreciate that response, and quite honestly, I do appreciate your efforts and your entire staff's efforts. This has taken a lot of legal interpretation, but I'm still not clear that we actually do have the authority to use a 2023 10-year annexation date, whether conditional or not, but I'll leave that. 
for now. Um, I will say that I'm surprised that the developers or the applicant isn't here. It's most unusual. Never in my 10 years of experience has the applicant not been present in front of council to respond to questions. I actually consider it highly disrespectful. I'll leave it at that. I will just remind citizen, uh, people that the developers, Alex Mitchell and Neil Hunter, the co-founder and former CEO of Cree, are not here, nor is their attorney former Democratic Senate candidate Cal Cunningham, okay? I recommend that you all remember those names, okay? Um, I wanna thank everyone, quite sincerely, for the years of effort on this project. It's been, I know, more heartache than I can imagine to see what all of you as citizens have fought really hard for, and of course, for the funds that have been invested in the lawsuits. I also want to thank folks for the very thoughtful and unique comments that we've gotten in the most recent email barrage. This was not a, you know, one-liner, here you go. I was really taken aback by the hundreds of emails with personal stories. Many people I'd never met or heard of before, residents in the area, all over the city. These were heartfelt messages. This was not a, a routine email campaign, so thank you all for that. So I'm gonna say that I appreciate my colleague's position on bringing this forward, the water and sewer extension request in the face of threatened legislative, sorry, can't talk, legislative action. But I personally cannot ignore the many maneuvers related to the rezoning of this property that have gotten us to this point. This project is a poster child for land use planning, bad, poor, excuse me, poor land use planning, backdoor schemes and intimidation, including administrative amendments to the lake boundary, disregard of sound science on the lake survey, lawsuits, and subversion of our citizens' right to a protest petition with a very controversial land donation to NCDOT, among others. In this most recent batch of emails, we got emails from four N former NCDOT staffers that had very specific comments about this. I'm telling you, this was a very wide-ranging um, expressed concerns from our citizens. So I'll just say that I've expressed concerns about this project in the past. They're all a matter of public record. I stand by those concerns, and I'll be voting no. And I sincerely hope that my colleagues will join me. If the General Assembly wants to force us to extend water and sewer, then let them do it. This council should not do it. Council Moffitt. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to say this was this this was not a simple decision for me. I, I find it to be a complex issue with many facets, but I intend to vote no. The deciding factor for me is that the project this is the deciding factor for me. The project completely undermines the comprehensive plan. For some, the comp plan is merely a document and a formality, but for me, it represents the community's vision for our city, the city in which our children are going to live. It was developed over an extended period of time by representatives from across the community, and it should not be disregarded. The irony of this situation is that there's a site that's ready to go for this project. With approval for 1,300 homes, a million square feet of office, and 150,000 square feet of commercial, right where it belongs, near I-40 on Page Road. Uh, while on the Planning Commission, I voted to recommend approval of that project. This developer plus that location could be glorious. But the location of 751 South will drive sprawl all the way to the Chatham County line and beyond. The choice we face is whether we want to be like Atlanta, with brutal car commutes and stop and go traffic, or whether we want a better, denser urban environment where development is focused along a transit corridor. Now, the community spoke through the comprehensive plan, and I cannot vote to undo that work and that vision. Thank you. I'm trying to recognize persons that want to speak on this item before I make comments. I recognize Councilman Brown and Councilman Shore. Chairman, <coughs> that order. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, 
former Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes was fond of saying that <clears throat> on occasion we all need a lesson in the obvious. So here's mine tonight. That regardless of how we it regardless of how we vote tonight, seven fifty one will be built. I do not necessarily say that with joy, but with the harsh reality I hear from the many colleagues I've spoken with, members of our local delegation, as well as representatives from the League of Municipalities. There are arguments for supporting this, some of which can be compelling. Well, if they're going to bill it anyway, then we might as well get something from them. That is a promise to enlarge 751 up until to the uh, interstate highway at an additional cost of around $2 million. Now, I applaud our mayor for trying and apparently getting an agreement done after long negotiations. And I will add to uh, my colleagues' comments, uh, Donald, that uh, I've been here for, for 10 years, and uh, for me, this is one of my more di di <coughs> difficult decisions. And I've pondered and gone back and forth and way into the night. And my record on development and development projects is usually in support of development. And indeed, uh, I do not believe that the, the D in developer stands for devil. But I must say, I'm troubled by this one. I don't like the fact that very few concessions have come from the developers particularly concerning density. I don't like the fact, as Diane pointed out, that we have gone from 167 acres now to 253 acres. And so what we're talking about here, ladies and gentlemen, is another Woodcroft size development next to a major water supply, Jordan Lake. And you do not need a PhD in environmental science to realize this is problematic. Indeed, some people would say idiotic. Concerning the highway expansion, I've been in real estate for over 30 years. And I have, perhaps more than anyone else sitting up here, some idea of what sells houses. And in my judgment, unless there is a decent and adequate transportation system to move the residents of these rather expensive homes from their home to their work, unless the road is enlarged, this development may go south. That is a top priority of anyone, really buying any home, and particularly to one that's in the 
price level of five, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars. Now, some of you don't know this, but uh, when I left Capitol Hill in Washington, I moved to Denver to be the director of communications for NCSL, which is the National Conference of State Legislatures. It's a nonprofit very much like the National Governors Association, except we represented all the state legislatures, state legislatures and legislators nationwide. I've learned many things from that experiment, and especially what works and what doesn't work about state legislatures. Now, I realize, as, as Tom pointed out, that cities are and were created by the state. But I must say, what we are seeing in Raleigh, what we're seeing with this General Assembly, with their intrusion upon local governments, and indeed even local school boards, is not the use of power, it is the abuse of power. <laughs> now, do I exaggerate? Perhaps. Talk to the city council members in Asheville, where the General Assembly forced them to regionalize their water department, or speak with the city and county leaders in Charlotte, where the General Assembly has ordered their airport authority to be reorganized. And look at what they have done in Wake County and Greensboro by forcing changes from the outside to everything from the voting districts to moving from nonpartisan to partisan elections to even the, the tenure from two to four years for school board members. Now, with some it is said that to rise up and vote against this development tonight by our, the Durham City Council may be the equivalent of giving the finger to the General Assembly. And they may in return respond by giving us their fist. I hope they're not that petty. But call me old fashioned but I don't like being intimidated by anyone. <laughs> Be it on the playground or in the halls of our General Assembly, bullies are not welcomed by Durham citizens. So why should we sell our public soul for the sake of supporting a development that is too big, too close to Jordan Lake, and too upsetting to too many surrounding neighborhoods. So tonight, let it be said that at least here, at least in Durham, we do not like negotiating with a gun to our heads, not here, not in the Bull City. Thank you. Uh, Recognize the Mayor Pro Tem and then Councilman Shule. Recognize Councilman Shule. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we all know what got us here. Every 
trick in the book has brought us to this point, every backdoor legal maneuver. And as we acknowledged in our six to nothing vote not very long ago, we know this isn't good for Durham. Uh, where is a developer and why won't he show his face here? I think we all know that reason too. Um, and we need to not be rolling over for these shenanigans. It's, uh, one of the speakers calls it extortion. It is extortion. There is no sense in taking a road in exchange for our acquiescence in this. If there is a $600 million development that eventually does get built down there, they're going to have to build that road anyway. Let's don't agree to, to let's don't agree to this so that in exchange for that in, in exchange for a road they would eventually have to build anyway. Let's don't agree to foul our own water supply. And let's don't sell Durham's soul for a road widening. Our community does not want this. No matter how much campaign money was spent here by the developer, our community has spoken on several occasions and it doesn't want this. So I hope that we will defeat this and if the General Assembly makes a decision, so be it. But. I don't think we ought to be acquiescing in it. And as I said, let's don't sell our soul for a road widening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. I just have a question for our uh, attorney. And I hate to put you on the spot because you're not a politician. <laughs> Now, what happens if we vote um, not to approve this item and the General Assembly um, passes a bill stating that we forcing us to do so? Do we really have to do it then or do we go to court? What do we do? And what would the cost be? Uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, um, you, you raised some, some very good questions, and of course I'm speaking hypothetically. Um, a lot of it depends on, on what, if anything, the General Assembly did in response to a vote to deny water and sewer uh, to this, this parcel. Um, but as I've mentioned before, we would look at whatever uh, comes out, if something comes out, uh, and certainly advise you at that time as to what you could and couldn't do. Um, having not, I've, I've seen drafts of what may come down, uh, but having not seen a live proposal, statute, what have you, I'm, I'm really at a, um, at a bad, <laughs> bad situation in terms of actually advising you on what might happen in the future. Uh, based on a, a statute or a, a directive from the General Assembly that they haven't actually made uh, yet. But I would tell you that we would review it and then advise you in terms of what your options um, could be at that time. Um, if, if, if council, you know, if, if that situation occurred and council uh, directed, you know, we could, you know, file an action. I believe that Asheville has filed an action as it relates to um, uh, the situation with their their water system. Um, but again, I don't know what would be coming down and what I would recommend based on. You said Asheville was filing an action. It's my understanding that Asheville has filed a complaint to enjoin the enforcement of uh, of that statute. They're challenging that statute. than anything is um, I thought that we would be able to get that 10-year annexation 
annexation clause in place. And we are seemingly there waiting to see what we're going to do even with, the, with that. It, it is not in my nature to do anything um, in a retaliatory fashion because I don't think that we will prosper uh, from that, but somehow I just don't trust um, any of the players in this process. And so I'm going to have to meditate over the next uh, few moments to see which way I'm going to go with this. I'm really troubled that we are at this point in the history of the state of North Carolina where uh, we have spirits um, that are, I don't know how to describe them, that are taking us back to slavery times. And that's the way that I, I, I see this now, as, as if we are slaves to the General Assembly. That's not a good feeling. Um, and I'm supposed to be on voice rest, so I'm going to stop talking. If, if no one else wants to comment, I'm, I'm going to share my thoughts with the uh, council on this issue. Uh, I don't think anyone is surprised at, at my comments. Uh, and I, I guess, first of all, I need, I need to say for the record and for persons who have spoken, uh, I'm being truthful with myself and what I say and what I do. I have no reason to be any other way but that. I've probably have been closer to this situation than any of my colleagues on the council, not because of my choosing, uh, because I'm the mayor of the city of Durham. Uh, I think we just need to recall the only reason we are here tonight discussing this issue about the extension of water and sewer is because when it came up last year in the General Assembly, it fell by one vote at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning in the Senate side. It had already passed the House, uh, but not for the work of Senator McKissick and others. And I give Floyd credit because he stood there. It, it fell. But I should also tell you, because I, I think you need to understand this, uh, I should also tell you that shortly after that, uh, I received uh, a comment from a very reliable source from one of the leaders in the House to say that if the city and the developers were not able to resolve their disagreement, that this surely would come back to the General Assembly in this session, both on the House side and the Senate side. Uh, you can call that a threat, you call it whatever it is, but that's, that's the statement that, that came back, and I had no reason to, to not, not consider that. So I, I began giving some thoughts as to what our alternatives were, ours being the city council, in view of those comments. And my rationale was not just for the present, but for the future of the city council not this city council, but future city councils, and looking at that project. Uh, we were dealt the cards we have. Uh, this was all a county zoning matter. Uh, the city never set the zoning for this issue. Uh, when the developers came to us and almost demanded that we respond to their request for extension of sewer and water utilities, uh, we said unanimously no. Now, different people might have had different reasons why they said no, but my rationale was that we have said very clearly that we were not going to entertain the issue of extending the water and sewer utilities until the litigation had been settled. And as some of you know, there was some litigation going on. Others might have had other reasons for it. Uh, so we said no. And it was after that that they went to the General Assembly and got 
legislation, which I just described, which came within a vote of passing on the Senate side. Since that time, I'm convinced, I'm convinced, and that's why I'm telling you I'm being truthful, I'm convinced that no matter what action we take tonight, either to say yes or no, and it's pretty obvious it's gonna be no, that the General Assembly is gonna pass legislation which will force the city of Durham to provide water and sewer utilities to that development as it presently has been zoned by Durham County. That's my thought. Now, I could very well be wrong, but I'm telling the, re the rationale for why I've taken the position that I've taken and will continue to take. So if I believe that, I'm not saying what's gonna be built, if I believe that there's gonna be a requirement that water and sewer utilities be extended to that development, my question is what type of things can we get out of that from the city? And there were only two things really. I mean, because the development had already been zoned, it wasn't a question of going back, reducing densities or changing this. There are about 46 plus committed elements in this, in this development, and one of them being a commitment to affordable housing. Those weren't the issues to be discussed. What were to be discussed was how can we get 751 widened to accommodate the resultant traffic that this development would, would, would bring in the event that it was developed to its fullest. And that's part of the agreement which the attorney didn't speak to, this in a part of that agreement, that the developers will widen, widen 751 up to Renaissance Parkway, uh, with the exception of the portion that, that would depend on other developers to, to widen. The other issue was, which was a lot more broader than just 751. Uh, We've been fortunate as a city and cities across the state to be able to grow and develop and expand because of the annexation laws, which basically said cities could involuntarily annex properties if they saw it to be to their benefit. I mean, I, I sat on, it's, it sort of reminds me of when I was chair of the Board of County Commissioners and we were going through this whole issue about whether or not we should approve the development of Traven, watershed issues, and et cetera. And I was on the county side, it wasn't the city side. But a part of that was that Traven knew that at some point in time, when it became feasible for the city, they were gonna be annexed to take advantage of the resultant tax base. The way the laws have been written now, that's not gonna happen it's gonna be very hard to annex any piece of property unless persons voluntarily want to be annexed. Uh, one of the things that we did, and I'm repeating it, but I, I think it's important, one of the things that was done, even when this was being considered for annexation, when the developers made the request for annexation, the staff went through and did the financial feasibility. As when would it be financially feasible for the city to annex this area, such the services we provided uh, would not be at a, at a at a loss to the city, it will be a net gain. And the estimation was that it could be anywhere from seven to eight to 10 years, depending on how soon it developed. So that was another reason as a part of this discussion uh, with the persons over in Raleigh on the, on the house side was to get our charter changed. So that in the future, anytime someone came to us and asked to be annexed, we could make that decision up to 10 years rather than the three short years our present charter requires. So that's another part of the provision that was in this. So having at least gotten a commitment on the part of the developers as the attorney has described in the written contractual agreement and a commitment from the persons in the house that that would happen left me with the position that I would rather see the annexation take place with a guarantee that the road was gonna be widened, the fact that we had up to 10 years to annex this property, and also would allow for any other pieces of property that come to the city's attention for annexation, they would be in the same situation. And I'm convinced again that 
the General Assembly is going to require the city of Durham to provide water and sewer. And if it does under those conditions, whether 751 gets built or not, it certainly isn't going to be get built by the developers. I, I don't necessarily agree that the developers are going, to, are going to spend the money to do it. They may, and that's good. And the other part about it is that we won't have the annexation change in our charter. So it doesn't put, it puts future councils in a disadvantage in trying to deal with, with the annexation issues. I haven't tried to pressure anyone on this council to vote either way on this issue. I've simply presented my best guess, my best rationale for saying what I've said. And I respect their choices in terms of how they vote. We'll deal with this and move on to the next issue. So I'm going to call a question on, I'm going to close the public hearing on this item. I'm going to call a question on what's before us. And what's before us is a request for annexation of this particular property, which would include the extension of water and sewer utilities, conditioned on the fact that the General Assembly passed legislation which would change, change the charter for the city from annexation from three years to 10 years. Uh, I think that is the question that was before us. And uh, I think we all know we, we uh, phrase the question in the positive so people can vote negative for it. Re recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. Let me just say, Mr. Mayor, I have a lot of respect for you and the work that you've done on, on this. And even though I uh, am still troubled by how this has all come about, I am uh, going to vote in, in support of, um, of um, this um, uh, item. Um, not feeling good about it, but I do respect uh, the way that you um, came across in your explanation. Again, as I can't make the motion, but I would entertain a motion on item. Recognize Councilwoman Katati. I move the item with the intention of voting no. Is there a second to the motion? Second. It's been properly moved and second. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It fails three to four with Mayor Bell voting yes, Council Member Clement voting yes, and Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden voting yes. Let's move to the items that were pulled. That's uh, item eight, Victoria Peterson on the consent agenda. No, you, you go ahead, look, Victoria. You have three minutes. I'm waiting for it to show up. Thank You're you. Waiting for whom? For my minutes. Oh, the, oh, the timing. Okay. Time. You have two minutes. I'm sorry. Mr. Two minutes. Can you start it over again? Do I have three minutes? Two. Two. Mm -hmm. Thank this you. Is, this is a consent agenda. All right. Uh, Mr. Mayor, just wanted to just to sort of ask some questions here. Uh, quickly, I was trying to add some numbers up here, and you know, I, I support trying to help our youth in the community. Um, but this budget here, um, on number eight, well over, well over 50% of the budget is, gonna, is going towards staff. And I just have a little concern about that. Um, it says $92,000 uh, for staff. Uh, and then you have uh, uh, 26,000 for health benefits. But it doesn't tell you how many staff members this budget is really taking care of. And I just, I would sort of like to know that. Also, I would really like to ask the city manager if he could get some kind of report of how many youth, with some names, of the youth that this company has tried to help. Um, they have here somewhere in something I was reading that 93 of the young folks are still in limbo. Uh, it doesn't state that they're employed. It doesn't state that they're in the GED. It's just that they're still working with 93. 
And in the report, it mentions GED as well as employment and as well as job training. And I would like to see if we can at least get how many young folks are actually employed, who are they employed with, how many of them, it does mention about the GED, but it doesn't mention about what kind of training, what kind of job training are they doing. Also, is, it, is there a possibility of some of the projects that's coming down that this organization is working with some of the new jobs so that some of these young folks can get hired? I'm assuming if some of them are going to college, then they must at least be 18. Um, I was also curious of the age. Uh, but anyway, Mr. Mayor, I don't know if anyone can answer those questions, but I would like to see some kind of written report of how many young people are actually working because a lot of numbers are thrown out and as I said, they're, they're asking for 175,000, but I added up about 140 some thousand is being put on staff, so. Okay, do we have our, any comments on this? Mr. Mayor and Council, again, Kevin Dick with the Office of Economic and Workforce Development. Um, Ms. Peterson mentioned several questions, and so I'll try to take them one by one. Um, number one, um, to my best knowledge, the, uh, the staff members that um, are employed by Community Partnerships, Inc. for the YES program um, provide career counseling. I um, believe it, there is a uh, program manager and three career counselors um, to help provide uh, framework services, which are basically intake, um, career counseling, uh, case management planning, and, and more or less um, life guidance to um, 100 and... Um, um, 50, excuse me, 140 um, youth per year. And so basically uh, young people that receive these kinds of services that are out of school, that are hard to serve, um, cannot career counsel or case manage themselves. So staff salaries are required. The youth, uh, the age group um, of the youth that are being served are generally between the ages of 16 and 21. Um, 93 people that uh, are currently still um, enrolled in the program are in some form of either career counseling, intake, or case management activity. Many of them are in educational activities such as GED or high school diploma um, pursuit. The, uh, federally, uh, the federal common measures that govern the program um, actually have um, various uh, outcomes that youth are trying to achieve, not just employment. So there's a positive outcome rate that relates to either being, uh, generally speaking, employed, enrolled, or enlisted. There are um, attain skill credential attainment uh, goals, as well as literacy and numer numeracy gains. And so, as I said, the young people that are being served range in age from 16 to 21. So employment is not always the goal um, for those particular individuals. Um, Another activity that a young person could be involved with is occupational skills training. But there's a myriad of services, there's a myriad of um, job preparation activities that young people um, are involved with. Um, and so, you know, to, to ask exactly how many are being employed by the program, I don't have that number right now. But what I do, ha what I do know is that this provider over the past several years um, has helped our region to exceed um, the, the youth goals that are based on, upon the federal common measures that govern Workforce Investment Act programs. So hopefully that addresses right. so, so Mr. Questions. Dick, to the extent that the information is public record, could you uh, provide that to Ms. Peterson? Uh, with numbers but not names, right. yes. Thank you. Okay, entertain a motion on item. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. 
It passes seven and zero. And finally, item nine, Ms. Peterson again. Senator tonight, nine contract amendment with Achievement Academy of Durham provide workforce investment act youth program element services from July one to December thirty one. Yes, Mr. Mayor. You have two minutes. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Same thing again. Um, I I think that if we're going to be allowing these programs to receive dollars, we've got to get some better reporting here. And it should be in the report how many of our young folks are employed, how many of them are working on their GED, and what kind of training they are. If you have a hundred and some young people that are in this program, 10 of them are working on their GED, 12 of them are, are, are at Durham Regional Hospital in the nurses' aid program. 30 of them are working over there at Duke. There should be a breakdown, not just somebody coming out, throwing out numbers, not really showing and proving. When we had our program, at least we have our program, but when we were dealing with the federal dollars, we had to give an account, names, and social security numbers to show that these people were actually in the program. And for several years now, we come in, there's city money, state monies, and government monies given to these programs, but that doesn't seem to show our young people who are really active in these programs. We have still a, a, a huge, a large numbers of juvenile crime going up in this community. If we have all these programs, then why is it that juvenile crime is growing? Do we have an area for those young kids who have committed crimes? Those are in some of those programs, are they in these, these programs to get the job training, to get the GED? I just think that there needs to be some better reporting not trying to get on anyone, just some better reporting here. Thank, thank you, Ms. On, Peterson. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. On how many young people are being funded. And thank you, Mr. Mayor. You're quite welcome. So, Mayor, I can get a report on that also. Uh, Mr. Bonfield? He, he can talk to you afterwards. You. you don't have to go through it now. I say he can get with you afterwards. Uh, entertain a motion on an item. Move. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? You close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Are there any other items to come before the council as we adjourn at 11.42 p.m.? Thank you. Means adjourn. Whew. Thank you. Good